It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up on alert. This morning, severe weather across the nation. Parts of the Midwest and plains facing historic flooding. Millions down south getting hit with another round of violent storms. We are live with the latest. Then stars in Studio 1A. First, Naomi Watts is here live on a mission to help women embrace menopause. The important conversation on a topic not often discussed. And Priyanka Chopra Jonas, the global superstar, is here with a big announcement you do not want to miss. And feeling drafty. Excitement is building as the NFL draft kicks off tonight. The best college football players in the nation getting ready for their big moment. Where I'm drafted, where I'm picked, um, you know, that's stuff that I can't control. And I'm big on, you know, focusing for my, you know, what I can't control. So who will be the top pick? Where they're live today, Thursday, April 27th, 2023. Happy Thursday from Kansas City, Missouri. Columbus, Ohio. Tupelo, Mississippi. And Washington, D.C. Good morning to my second graders at Broken Arrow Elementary in Shawnee, Kansas. From Seattle. It's my first time in New York. Good morning to my mom watching in Lochapoca, Alabama. From Marshall, Indiana. On a girl's trip celebrating our 60th birthday at the Today Show. Woo! It's 8.16. We've got Oscar-nominated actress Naomi Watts with her, us this morning, and she is on a mission to help women embrace menopause. It is an important conversation. So here are the numbers. More than one million women in the United States experience it each year, but a recent survey found that just 6% wow. felt prepared for the symptoms, including... We know them. Hot flashes, brain fog, sleeping problems. Naomi, it's so good to see you. Good to see this you is guys. a good conversation to have because I do think it is one of those things that for years people would almost try to fake their way through it. Yeah. Are you hot? No, I'm fine. It's just I'm just a little warm. Yeah, they it was, was almost in taboo. our training. Yes. Yes. To, this, you know, grin and bear it. Just yeah. suck it up and cope because our mothers didn't have these conversations with us because their mothers didn't. Yeah. And the, the cycle was just passed on. And the tide is changing, which is great news because to be ahead of it is wonderful. Like yeah. if I'd known more, if I had knowledge of what was going on, I wouldn't have been, you know, spiraling out of control. The mood swings, the, the night sweats, the migraines, all of these things converging and no information and no community. Right. And no real help from your doctors because they don't prepare you. No. Right. They, right. You it's know, not until you're... Until Desperate. you're in the middle of yeah, it. Yeah, in the right. middle of it. Yes. And, and, and there has sort of been this grin and bear it mm -hmm. kind of idea that women, you know, like, don't talk about it and just get through it. Yeah. yeah. And you're kind of saying, like, let's put it all out in the open. Let's put it in the light. Because yeah. then we can Well, we're share. all headed there at some point or another, yeah. right? Half of the population and the rest of the population may be indirectly affected by it. So just bring it out onto the table. It's a natural phase of well, life. I think some women may think, and maybe in your industry and in ours too, sometimes you think, well, when that happens, that's saying something about you and your viability. Like in, in in the acting world, I'm sure you uh, know yeah. they told you. I don't know what they told you. What did they say about? Oh, how it'll long all you be last? over at forty. I'll be over oh. at forty. <laughs> so maybe that's another reason people are like, why don't we just kind of keep that in the back pocket? Yeah. Well, I think things are changing, yes, which is great are. news um, in my industry and in all industries. Yes. In fact, I feel like. Dare I say it, aging is trending. We're living yes. longer, yeah. right? Yes. We're living longer, so we may as well live our best versions of ourselves yeah. and, and, you know, come at it with vibrancy and mm -hmm. honesty and authenticity. When you decided to take this on, I mean, there still is a stigma, and I think yeah. people say, yeah. like, menopause, and they imagine, like, some... Yes. old lady or something right. and it's just not i mean yeah. like it, it, mm -hmm. it, well, that's, just, that's it looks right. different now Did, were you afraid like okay do i want to make this my issue i was definitely yeah. afraid yeah. i definitely oscillated back and forth is this a good idea is this a bad idea and eventually i just thought well you know i've got to get over myself and my fear because yeah. i feel like it, in a way, it's going to buy me more time in Hollywood if everyone gets on board. Yeah. But and and I, as I said, I do think people are opening up to this discussion now because we're very aware that we can live so much longer. Well, this could be nearly, you know, half of your life that you could be 
menopausal yeah. or a third. And I think you need products. Like I, I, feel, I felt like, I mean, that's part of the reason that you're here too. You need something to yeah. help you through this, a product skin yes. for your so skin. So you have, you have a skincare line, line, line that's for post-menopausal yes. women. I mean, has that even been done before? Peri menopausal, Peri menopausal okay. right through to. What's it yeah. called? Tell it's us about called it. It's called Stripes. Uh -huh. Okay. Because, and I, I came up with that name because I felt like We've earned it. Mm -hmm. We are we are still relevant. We are, mm -hmm. we can reclaim ourselves. We can lean into this time and mm -hmm. um, with vibrancy. And um, you know, one stripe doesn't live alone. It, it, you have yeah. to have a, a community. I yeah. like that. So um, yeah, the 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 products are from scalp to. Badge. If we're allowed to say that word, <laughs> what can we? I don't know. I don't either. But anyway, but, uh, sorry, shoot me. Um, but um, yeah, and it's to address uh, dehydration with loss of estrogen. Yeah. You um, need right. extra sure. hydration, yeah. and um, all the products are available on IamStripes.com. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Right. Ow, my eye is hurting. Do you see anything? There's like a big glint coming from some ring over here. Oh, a very. I was like, I can't stop looking at happening. it. Okay. No, I don't know. I didn't know, it but just, now I know. It, it just struck me, but it's beautiful. <laughs> How is asking if you're no. engaged? Well, I just want. It's so beautiful. I just anyway. Oh, so, the brain fog. I, 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 <laughs> All right, Naomi. You thank, wear it well. You do. Whatever you're wearing, you wear it beautifully. Thank you for joining thank us. Thank you, Please appreciate Naomi. It. God. Hold on a second. I, I think there are some child labor laws here, but, 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 but maybe not. Uh, who, wow! Look at we're we're getting our camera wa our wire pullers uh, younger and younger. Hi, Tyler. How you doing? Good. Good. All right. Well, how much is Dad paying you? Uh, I don't know. All right. All the pop tarts you can eat. All right, Savannah. We love TV Dad. All right, Al, thank you guys. It is almost May, and that means it is time to announce a new read with Jenna Pick. Jenna is here to do the yes, honors. We're I holding am. it behind us. We're holding it. We're hiding it. Drum roll, please. The May Pick is Chain Gang All Stars by Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya. It is a debut novel. It's available to pre order right now. Just okay. scan that QR code or head today.com. Well, I love when you tell me, I love asking you about books, but we only have a four hour okay. show. Why do you love this book? Okay, I'll try to get to it quickly. Okay, think Hunger Games for adults, okay? It is a book that pushed me in ways that I've never been pushed before. It pushed me out of my comfort zone as a reader, mm. which I think is important to do. It's set in the distant future where criminals fight like gladiators mm. to win their freedom, I know, but it's a televised sport. Okay, again, Hunger Games ask, yes. but with a love story okay. at the center. It's really grounded and it's about how desensitized we become to violence mm. and a commentary on the prison industrial complex. But this book will move you and you will love it and it will make you discuss everything. I'm going to give that one to Nancy. Okay, to my okay? mommy. And it will change you. And I think that, you know, sometimes the important books are the ones that are a little trickier to read. Yes, but good for you for highlighting it and Nana is us. brilliant and I think he'll be here next week. Okay, I love that. Jenna, thank you so much. Coming up next, we're going to sit down with Priyanka Chopra Jonas, an inside look at her new spy thriller. Everybody's raving <laughs> about this, Priyanka. And then an exclusive reveal. We don't want you to miss it. But first, this is Today on NBC.
are back with a global superstar, Priyanka Chopra Jonas. She is a talented actress, a producer, a best-selling author, a wife and a mother. And this morning, we can exclusively announce that Priyanka is our next <sighs> Today cover star. We are going to have more on that in a moment, and we're going to talk about that. But first, check out Priyanka's new spy thriller. It's called Citadel. I see you left me a few new toys. Yes, I built them for my favorite spy. Aww. He hated them, and I didn't want them to go to waste, so. The compact can track a target a mile away. The perfume is a localized explosive. What about the lipstick? Lipstick. Nothing more dangerous to a pervy old man than red lips. You would know. Gotta go. By the way, you are such, I think we can say, badass on TV, but you are in, in Citadel. We can say that? I guess we just did, <laughs> but wow. We're going to talk about Citadel, but can we just talk about your Today cover? It's stunning, gorgeous, amazing. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what this Flowers is for like. Spring, you I think love it's original? it. <laughs> yes, I love it. Look at you. Thank you. No, yeah. but we wanted to lean into that, and I think it was such an, a talented team that you guys had. We had fun, you know, pretty pictures great people good day at shoot I just feel like you're doing it all you're shooting that cover you've got Citadel your wife your mom um, how is Malty let's start there with that cute she's babe she's great she's yeah. here with me she is um, of yeah course. she's I've been schlepping her on this <laughs> tour not everywhere my mom and her are both uh, traveling with us right now because I'm on tour my husband's on tour um, but, you know, we'll settle down in another couple of weeks, so we should be okay. I think you have such a great way when it comes to the, your core family. Yes. Like, you have rules about how you are, how much time you guys need to be yes. together. Tell it's, me about that. It's very important. Family yeah. time is most important. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that in my 20s. I've been doing this for a really long time, like almost 23 years now. And I ran so hard. And, you know, when you find your home and you build a family that you appreciate and that makes you feel like you want to go to work every day and do mm -hmm. your best, mm -hmm. then you have to make time for it because mm -hmm. I feel great when I leave in the morning to go to work because I've had that time with my family and it's magical and it's healing. Do you feel like, uh, you said you were sprinting your whole life and now yeah. you're, you're still doing a lot, but I don't feel like you're going in that gear no. that is kind of that desperate, I've got to get it done gear. No, but you know when you first start your career and it's like, and especially my job, there's no consistency in my job. You don't know when your next check is coming. You don't know, you know, you got to kind of think about the practical side of that. So you run all the time, you're hustling. And then I think, you know, you kind of reach a point where you have a little bit of credibility so you can stand and take some time. And that's where I've reached now where I have a work-life balance which is very important to me 7 7 30 7 o'clock I'm done mm -hmm. from work I like to have a couple of hours with my family I like to wake up early with my baby I like to be with my dogs and with that husband of yours you said at night is your night your time with with your husband yes and that's that's important too do you get to go to his concerts are you able to whenever I can I love <laughs> going to their shows yeah. I think they are extremely hopeful you know it makes me happy you know what i love about your relationship it's like you were like you know what you're too young when you met him you're like no not you not <laughs> you and then he just showed you that wow this is actually a beautiful beautiful relationship and age is really just a number i mean i don't yeah. think about it i think people think about it a lot more than i do yeah let's talk citadel for a second i mean what first of all Choosing this seems like the perfect fit for you in Thanks. so many ways. Thank what you. was it like shooting it? What 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 is that experience well, been this like? This shows like five years in the making. Mm -hmm. We started discussing it five years ago, and it's extremely special because it's never been attempted in entertainment before. There are multiple installments of this show: one in mm -hmm. Italy, one in India, one in America, and they're all dubbed and subbed in like multiple languages. Mm -hmm. And all of the stories are con connected. So you have filmmakers and writers from these countries and. You know, we're kind of creating a, a, a franchise, an original IP, with, which is actually truly global. And it's, it's so cool as an international actor who's worked in multiple languages. Mm -hmm. Like, that's amazing to be able to set the stage and allow people from different countries to play in the same sandpit <laughs> and create stories. It's awesome. You're, like, you're a remarkable human being. I had the good fortune <laughs> of sitting down with you for a long time for your cover shoot. And I, 
I would encourage people to listen to that conversation. I was so touched and moved by just you, your journey from being a little girl to where you are today. I just feel like you're such a role model, and I want to say thank you. Thank I think you. it's really cool. Thank you for sitting with us. Don't forget Catch Citadel, which is, of course, tomorrow. Tomorrow on, on Prime, Prime Video. Video. Don't, oh, we won't forget. It's going to be big. Tomorrow. Are you excited? Yes. Come yes. on. Tomorrow's the big day. Okay. Head over to today.com. <laughs> Please check out the full cover story on beautiful Priyanka. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, Craig, over to you. Oh, we love Priyanka. Thank you, Hoda. Uh, if you're looking for a sign to book a vacation right now, this is your sign. Travel and Leisure's editor-in-chief is here with some practical solutions to common sources of summer travel stress. But first, this is today on NBC. We are back with today travel now in the summer season, of course, right around the corner. And there's this new Expedia study that shows most Americans are feeling vacation deprived. More than 70% of people find booking travel to be stressful and they feel the impacts of that inflation on their wallets. On top of all of that, more than half of workers say it's challenging to take time off. So we brought in an expert to help us, uh, Jackie Gifford, Editor-in-Chief of Travel and Leisure. Jackie, good morning. Good morning. We don't want travel to be stressful. No. no. So what can we? What can folks do about it? Because a lot of folks do find the planning of travel to be, to be quite stressful, myself included. Well, we're heading into the summer season. First thing to do is to set a price tracker alert when it comes to your flight. So go to your favorite website app. What you do is you enter where you want to go, the dates, and they're going to tell you, you know what, we're going to watch this for you. Okay. If flights, if the prices go down, this is is the time to book or they'll tell you, you know what, right now is the best time to book. I do this myself and it takes out the stress of guessing, you know what, is my flight, am I booking with the right sure. price? Yeah. Then this, the second thing I would say is to do a price drop guarantee. So some websites allow you to do this. If you decide to go ahead and book that flight, yeah. you pay a nominal fee. And if the flight price goes down in the future, oh, they will the refund you the difference. Now, this oh. doesn't happen all the time, but it gives you that peace of mind when you go ahead and make that purchase. This third tip is... I swear by this. Yes. So avoid tight connections, if at all possible. Some people decide, you know what, I'm going to take a I'll, I'll take a connecting flight because it's going to save me a little bit of money. I honestly think in the long run, because of how crazy airports can be, the stress of having to connect, if you miss 
that flight, you miss a day of vacation. So try to do nonstop if possible. And this last tip is if, if you've got some flexibility. Totally. If you have flexibility, and this doesn't work for everybody, but try to book midweek stays at hotels. In general, you're going to see that the rates are going to be more affordable. People still are tied a lot to weekends, but if you can, do a Monday to a Friday instead of a Wednesday to a Sunday. So, again, a lot of folks, they, they feel like it's it's hard to take time off from work. Yeah. They don't have the flexibility, perhaps, to take a full week off for a vacation. What can they do? I would say don't feel the pressure to take a full week or two weeks off. That's the dream. But the reality is you can do a three, a four-day break and still have a restorative time. So think about July 4th coming up. It's actually on a Tuesday. Combine this with a holiday weekend. Oh. So you take that Friday and the Monday. You're only using two days of vacation, but you're getting a five-day break. I really think people should take that stress out of the planning process and look at their holiday can calendar and plan for the whole year. You don't want to get to the end of the year and not have any vacation time. And I should add, take a road trip. If yeah. it's something spontaneous, that can be easy too. What if I, I, I get some time last minute, some, some last minute days off? What can yeah, I, do? I would say, you know what, again, take a road trip. Just pick up and go. Look at some apps and websites and, and base it around where you can get the most affordable local hotel deal. All right, let's speaking of affordability. Let's yes. talk about that now for folks who are trying to perhaps take a bit of a break, but they need to do it on a budget. What are the options? Yeah, here? I think bundling pricing, when you go to a website and, you know, an online travel agency, what they're going to do, they can bundle flights, hotels, car rentals for you. Don't book all those things individually because they're able to get better pricing. So when you book all those things together as a package, it's often more affordable. Then flight timing is key too. look for Tuesdays and Wednesdays to fly or a Wednesday to Wednesday period. That's going to be typically cheaper oh. than a Saturday to Saturday. And earlier flights are typically cheaper. So that 7 a.m. flight, I know it's annoying, but it's typically more affordable and less likely to, to get, get a delay canceled. Yeah. and canceled. And then again, with the road trip, if you've booked your rental car, we do the two minute trick. So every week, check and see if the rental car is cheaper because typically you get free cancellation. So oh. book it in advance, set your timer, two minutes every week and check it. And if it's more affordable, cancel that first reservation and book another one. Really quickly, lastly here, 10 seconds. How far out should you book to get the best deal? That's a really good question. I would say, you know what? Typically, I like to look three to four months in advance, but sometimes spontaneity, that can win out too. All right. Jackie, thank you. Thank you. Great tips there. By the way, you can find May's issue of Travel and Leisure on newsstands right now. Mr. Daly. Oh, you can just smell it. It's so good. Thank you so much. Matt Abdu is here, our buddy. Pig Beach is going to have something special going on this weekend. We're making a brisket sandwich that's also all for a great cause. We're going to tell you all about it. Plus, Matt's niece, Hayes, is back there with my daughter, London, on Take Your Kid to Work Today, making up. What are you guys doing over there? Decorating cupcakes. Decorating cupcakes. That's right. Making them, decorating uh, the floor. Nice work, Hayes. Have that's fun. a good one. All right, so we're going to have all this for you coming up. We're going to talk about this brisket sandwich here with Matt first. This is today on NBC. <laughs> We are back with today's travel now in the summer season, of course, right around the corner. And there's this new Expedia study that shows most Americans are feeling vacation deprived. More than 70% of people find booking travel to be stressful and they feel the impacts of that inflation on their wallets. On top of all of that, 
More than half of workers say it's challenging to take time off. So we brought in an expert to help us, uh, Jackie Gifford, Editor-in-Chief of Travel and Leisure. Jackie, good morning. Good morning. We don't want travel to be stressful. No. no. So what can, we, what can folks do about it? Because a lot of folks do find the planning of travel to be, to be quite stressful, myself included. Well, we're heading into the summer season. First thing to do is to set a price tracker alert when it comes to your flight. So go to your favorite website app. What you do is you enter where you want to go, the dates, and they're going to tell you, you know what, we're going to watch this for you. Okay. If flights, if the prices go down, this is is the time to book or they'll tell you you know what right now is the best time to book I do this myself and it takes out the stress of guessing you know what is my flight am I booking with the right sure. price yeah then this the second thing I would say is to do a price drop guarantee so some websites allow you to do this if you decide to go ahead and book that flight yeah. you pay a nominal fee and if the flight price goes down in the future oh, they will the refund you the difference now this oh. doesn't happen all the time but it gives you that peace of mind when you go ahead and make that purchase this third tip is I swear by this. Yes. So avoid tight connections if at all possible. Some people decide, you know what, I'm going to take a I'll, I'll take a connecting flight because it's going to save me a little bit of money. I honestly think in the long run, because of how crazy airports can be, the stress of having to connect, if you miss that flight, you miss a day of vacation. So try to do nonstop if possible. And this last tip is if, if you've got some flexibility. Totally. If you have flexibility, and this doesn't work for everybody, but try to book midweek stays at hotels. In general, you're going to see that the rates are going to be more affordable. People still are tied a lot to weekends. But if you can, do a Monday to a Friday instead of a Wednesday to a Sunday. So, again, a lot of folks, they, they feel like it's it's hard to take time off from work. Yeah. They don't have the flexibility, perhaps, to take a full week off for a vacation. What can they do? I would say don't feel the pressure to take a full week or two weeks off. That's the dream. But the reality is you can do a three- or four-day break and still have a restorative time. So think about July 4th coming up. It's actually on a Tuesday. Combine this with a holiday weekend. Oh. So you take that Friday and the Monday. You're only using two days of vacation, but you're getting a five-day break. I really think people should take that stress out of the planning process and look at their holiday can calendar and plan for the whole year. You don't want to get to the end of the year and not have any vacation time. And I should add, take a road trip. If yeah. Something spontaneous. That can be easy, too. What if I, I, I get some time last minute, some, some last minute days off? What can yeah, I, I would say, you know what, again, take a road trip. Just pick up and go. Look at some apps and websites and, and base it around where you can get the most affordable local hotel deal. All right, let's speak of affordability. Let's yes. talk about that now for folks who are trying to perhaps take a bit of a break, but they need to do it on a budget. What are the options? Yeah, here? I think bundling pricing, when you go to a website and, you know, an online travel agency, what they're going to do, they can bundle flights, hotels, car rentals for you. Don't book all those things individually because they're able to get better pricing. So when you book all those things together as a package, it's often more affordable. Then flight timing is key too. look for Tuesdays and Wednesdays to fly or a Wednesday to Wednesday period. That's going to be typical typically cheaper oh. than a Saturday to Saturday and earlier flights are typically cheaper so that 7 a.m. flight I know it's annoying but it's typically more affordable and less likely to, to get, get a canceled. delay yeah. and canceled and then again with a road trip if you've booked your rental car we do the two-minute check so every week check and see if the rental car is cheaper because typically you get free cancellation so oh. book it in advance set your timer two minutes every week and check it and if it's more affordable cancel that first reservation and book another one. Really quickly, lastly here, 10 seconds. How far out should you book to get the best deal? That's a really good question. I would say, you know what, typically I like to look three to four months in advance, but sometimes spontaneity that can win out, too. All right. Jackie, thank you. Thank you. Great tips there. By the way, you can find May's issue of Travel and Leisure on newsstands right now. Mr. Daly. Hey, oh, you can just smell it. It's so good. Thank you so much. Matt Abdu is here, our buddy. Pig Beach is going to have something special going on this weekend. We're making a brisket sandwich. It's also all for a great cause. We're going to tell you all about it. Plus, Matt's niece, Hayes, is back there with my daughter, London, on Take Your Kid to Work Today, making up. What are you guys doing over there? Decorating cupcakes. That's right. Making them, decorating uh, the floor. Nice work, Hayes. That's a good one. All right, so we're going to have all this for you coming up. We're going to talk about this brisket sandwich here with Matt first. This is today on NBC. <laughs>
Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names only on today. See, we're coming in this early, right? Hey, everybody, it's today. Hey, like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about. Only on today. This morning on the third hour of today, draft day. Tonight, childhood dreams coming true for dozens of college players as one NFL legend begins a new chapter. This is a surreal day for me. We're live with all the football excitement. Plus, a sisterhood of dancers. I took everything that I didn't have when I was a kid. I created it here. See how they're forming special bonds one step at a time. And ooh, baby, baby, what a thrill. Motown legend Smokey Robinson live. We're going to catch up on his life, career, and he is performing new music just for us. Today, Thursday, April 27th, 2023. Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, this is the third hour of today. Good morning, and welcome to the third hour of today. I'm Kyan with my brother and sister, Uche and Clara. And I'm Delano Melvin. Like my dad likes to say, it's Friday Eve. Thank you for joining us this morning. And today, the kids are taking over. Woo! Wait, hold on a second. These guys are great. These guys are a little too good. Yes, my golly. Well done, how'd, that, how'd that feel? You guys did a great job. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. What do you say? Thank you. Clearly, you're already yeah. almost as tall as your mom. Well, no, that's not no, saying no. much. I'm sitting. <laughs> well, in case you guys haven't figured out, today is National Take Your Child to Work Day. And uh, no. here, it's Put Your Kids to Work Day. <laughs> <laughs> Craig and Janelle's kids have been hanging out with us all morning. It's been a lot of fun. The thing that's just driving me nuts is how big they've all gotten in what seems like yeah. an eye blink. How old, are you, how old are yours now? How old are you, kids? Are you I'm 13. And the twins? I'm 10. I'm 10. Wow. And there Del? Nine. Wow. Nine. Yeah. <laughs> What's been your favorite part of the morning so far, son? Everything. 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 There you go. What about, good. what about you guys? Favorite part so far? The food. The food? The food? The food. You know, Clara, you're, you're used to performing. You do musical theater. Is this, is this kind of like being on, t do you like this as much as being on TV? Um, yes, um, but it's a bit different because we're actually like doing it on a stage and we're not in front of a camera mm -hmm. and we don't have these type of mics. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. Hey, and do you do the same thing as your mom? Like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you do that kind of when you're talking? No. 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 Kai, do you have a favorite part? part? Uh, yeah, um, I really liked um, getting food, like all the behind the scenes stuff that you guys do. Um, Pretty cool. Can you yeah. make cupcakes for uh, oh, yeah. What about you, Uche? Anything so far? I liked, I liked the, um, the, like the camera move. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. The oh, yeah. Rooms. oh, the I control liked, room downstairs. Yeah, yeah. That's right. I liked that orange room because it leads to many places. It okay. does. That's right. We should mention yeah. Shemaine's son, Blake, is, is over Blake there. Is There's here. Blake. Blake. Hey. One Shemaine of our producers, Blake. Shemaine. You know. Hi, Blake. Hi, Blake. Good to see you, dude. Blake. How old are you? 11. 11. They're getting My so gosh. tall. Our kids have played video games together, so yep. that's, uh, that's their <laughs> and Director Lee Miller's kids are around somewhere. I saw them earlier today. So Are they down in the control room? I think they went right. back across. Oh, they're, oh they okay. went back across we'll the street. Okay. Well, this we is are, a pretty cool thing to do. This yeah. is so good. I remember when I was a little boy going to see my dad at work. Uh -huh. I to see my mom. She was a school teacher. My dad was a mail clerk yeah. at the post office. I still remember that. Wait oh, my gosh. Who, that, what are you talking no, about? No, you can't it's drink that. Tea? That's mine. Yeah, because there's something special in there. Oh, no, it's not. It's just green tea. Feel free to take That's what they call it. Green tea. tea. They make it. themselves right at home. I right. Look at this. That's right. That's my kombucha. You want to try Mr. Rooker's kombucha? No. No, you don't? No. No. You want your dad's green tea? <laughs> I love this. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. No, no, no. It's just too hot, son. All right. Well, we're going to. Here, why don't you. Oh, <laughs> Okay. Uh, all righty, guys. Well, we're going to usher you off. Maybe get you to the green room. Where you can, <laughs> that's your turn to leave. You can take some more sugar and stuff like that. You guys, sugar! <laughs> you guys, 
Those were great. Oh, oh he's got his like it. Oh, he's good. It he's all? good. He's got his feet so locked her up. Great job, oh. <laughs> What's happening? Here? I love you guys. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we'll see you I'll see you after the show. Oh, man. Okay, good job, guys. Or, or we'll will you? I love you. That's what happens when you start. <laughs> Look at you. You're sweating. I am. You get, I get extra nervous when. Oh, uh, hello. Uh, children are around. I'm ashamed. Carson sent me a text last night and he said, Hey, are you bringing the kids to work? And I'd forgotten. And I have to tell you guys, my kids have never been in 1A. Really? They've never done. No. Clara came years ago for Bring Your Daughter to Work Day, and we were outside on the plaza. Remember, uh, Michelle Obama right, was here. Right. It was uh, uh -huh. International oh, Day yeah, of Girl. Yeah. But the boys have never been here. And then with COVID, the last three years, we haven't had, you know, kids in the studio. So this is a first yeah. for them. Yeah. Really, it's it's special. I, I do miss it. I used to. You used yeah. to bring them in? Yeah. They. Uh, I mean, from Courtney to, to Nick and yeah. Leela, they've all been in. And in fact, a lot of times it was superfluous because I brought. They were in all the time. So. Yeah. But. Uh, uh, anyway, there you go. Well, thank so, you for bearing with this. Yeah, right. For our kids, it's something they're very remember. proud of, and I know you yeah. guys are extremely proud of them. But I'm, I feel like they're uncles. You, they call you, you are, exactly, <laughs> Uncle Al. Um, <laughs> let us turn now, though, to one of the NFL's tentpole events. We're talking about the NFL draft. It is tonight. It is in Kansas City. After months of speculating and debating, we're going to finally learn whose football dreams will come true. <laughs> NBC's Kaylee Hartung has made her way to Kansas City. She joins us now with the final countdown. Do we think the Panthers are going to take Young? We do. I think that's the only sure bet we've got in this draft. After that, all bets are off, starting with the Texans and the number two pick. But hey, man, this draft has really become something of a traveling roadshow for the league. And just as luck would have it, the home of the Super Bowl champs is hosting the draft this year. Now imagine all this green you can see around me filled with football fans. About 300,000 of them could be here today to get this party started tonight. But the celebration has already begun in New York as the Jets welcome their new quarterback. For a select few of the best college football players in the nation, being drafted in the first round is a crowning moment. The NFL draft is evolving into a spectacle for fans. And for young men like Devin Witherspoon and his mother Rashida, it's hard to contain their emotion. Once doubted because of his size, Devin's now projected to be a top 10 pick. You're a zero star recruit. Four years later, you're being talked about as the top cornerback in this draft. How did you do it? Hard work, dedication, and sacrifice. He played Pop Warner football, but his childhood dream was to be a basketball star until his mother intervened. One year, just give me one year. Would you be here today without your mom's encouragement? No. Nah. Are you ready to be an NFL mom? I was born ready for this. <laughs> just as a new group of potential stars enters the league, football's biggest storyline is about a player nearing the end of a legendary career. Future Hall of Famer Aaron Rodgers arriving in New York after 18 seasons with the Green Bay Packers. This is a surreal day for me. At 39 years old, the four-time MVP hopes to bring a Super Bowl to the Jets for the first time since 1969. I'm an old guy, so I want to be a part of a team that can win it all. And I believe that this is a place we can get that done. Rodgers famously endured public disappointment on his draft day back in 2005, when the Berkeley star fell to the 24th pick as cameras rolled. Now all eyes are on the next generation of quarterbacks. Odds makers making Alabama's Bryce Young the runaway favorite to go number one overall to the Carolina Panthers. You know, where I'm drafted, where I'm picked, um, you know, that's stuff that I can't control. And I'm big on, you know, focusing for my energy on what I can control. No matter what order the names are called, Kansas City, just months after their Super Bowl win, will be in the spotlight. Now, all the focus, as it is every year, is all on those top picks. But don't forget those later round selections. They can also be franchise changing. The most famous example, of course, Tom Brady wasn't picked until the sixth round. Hall of Famer Shannon Sharp, he was a seventh round pick. And Kansas City waited until the third round to pick Travis Kelsey. So, man, you just never know. This is what makes the NFL the best reality show on television, yeah, guys. True. It's true. Wow. And scripted. And the NFL sure. has also mastered the art of eventizing. Oh, my God. Okay. I use that word now that you use it. It's, it they, they, it's masterful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Kaylee. All right. Yeah, we didn't talk about the draft like this when we were. True. No, no. It just kind of happened. Right. Yeah. Right. And the you saw everything. But it's smart. We'll talk about it happening last night. Now that is oh. true. The other big sports story this morning: a historic upset in the NBA playoffs. Look at this. Over the top to Butler. Over in to be Butler. Ties the game with a half second to go. 
Oh, what a play call. My goodness, that's Miami Heat star Jimmy Butler with a last second Jeez. shot to send his team's game against the Milwaukee Bucks into overtime. The Heat would go on to seize control of that game, and they also win the series 4-1. to one. We should point out this is just the eighth time that an eight seed has beaten a one seed in the NBA playoffs. The Bucs were, were supposed to. I mean, a lot of folks had them going yeah. to the finals. You talk about the upside down. Knicks. In the, That's right. One of the the Heat so moving true. on to play the Knicks. I keep hearing Jimmy Butler's name. Team. Uh, they won their playoff series for the first time in ten years. They defeated the Cleveland Cavaliers in five games. Wow. Man, mix and the heat. There you go. Start there you some, go. The first two games in New York. That's it. That's it. They're going to start saying break kids. up the Knicks. I there love you. it. All right. Uh, but where'd the kids, where'd uh -oh. the kids go? I don't know. Uh, oh, oh, right oh, oh. There they are. Uh, they're downstairs in our control room. <laughs> Look at Claire. They are taking over down there. Claire's going to run the world. Uh, right. I'm just going to tell you that right now. There you now. go. She listens to Big Brother in her ear. That's how All that works. Right. Coming up next, we've got a really powerful story from our series Impact Thursday about violins. And these violins are rooted in not just history, but hope as well. Third hour of today, we'll be right back as the children. <laughs> she does dance, just like mom. Look at that, she does move. Look at that, oh, like guys. All right, Uche's gotta move too, so does Kai. back with Impact Thursday, and we, we've brought you a lot of stories over the years about the impact that music can have, but this one, this one's a little different. Mm -hmm. NBC's Jesse Kirsch is here to shine a light on a project that's called Violins of Hope. Yeah, good morning, guys. Great to be good with you. Good morning, good everyone watching at home. So this is an amazing story about the power of music, reminding us how special that force can be. One collection of violins and other string instruments is harnessing that force to honor victims of the Holocaust and to teach us an important lessons about tolerance at a time when we really need it. No matter what we take from this melody, with every note from these strings, we hear the music of survival. Rita, Avshi. Rita Ganinskaya and Avshalom Weinstein are living proof. Before this moment, they'd never met. At 94, Rita is almost 50 years Avshalom senior, but just outside Chicago last week, in a way, they reunited. Rita, a Holocaust survivor, remembers fleeing a Polish ghetto by tunnel to escape the Nazis during World War II. We were digging with spoons, sometimes with sticks, with whatever we could have. Along with her mother and sisters, Rita then hid in a forest in Belarus with resistance fighters who helped save roughly 1,200 Jews. The group was led by a set of brothers, including a man named Asoyl Bielski. Avshalom tells us Asoyl Bielski was his grandfather, one he never met. Rita lost more than 100 family members in the ghetto, in a camp, but herself, her two sisters and her mom survived the camp. It's all because of Bielski. The remarkable meeting between Rita and Avshalom made possible by Violins of Hope, Weinstein's family collection of more than 100 string instruments, which he says includes many once owned by those who perished in the Holocaust and those who survived. The collection now spending six months around Chicago at a crucial time. Record levels of anti-Semitism, rising hate, and it's really what we would consider hands-on experiential education. It's about the human story, and that's what we all share, humanity. Yeah, it's just... I mean, and they can still play. They practically sing. 
We're told this violin and its owner survived two concentration camps. There is hope and there is a lot of loss and there's a lot of history and there's a lot of beauty at the same time. The Violins of Hope Project says a man threw this violin from a cattle car pleading to passersby, take my violin so it may live. We don't know what happened to that man, but his violin's still here. His violin here. is still here, yeah, door by door, even without him, from generation to generation. Other instruments are dedicated to Holocaust victims. Is this project your way of honoring your grandfather? It's a way of honoring him and it's a way of making, trying to make sure people will never forget and hoping people will learn and it will never happen again. We've said that for decades, never forget. Does it feel more important now than it used to? Yes, uh, it's more important now simply because the amount of survivors is shrinking by the day. Their memories shared with many, including Irene Rogers, who tells us she too is a survivor. Music is still able to come from that instrument. Is that, is that the Jewish faith surviving? Oh, I'd say, I think so. Music is a symbol of survival. Music is a symbol of life. These instruments bring the stories to life. They make them real. They make them real and they make them with the music, it gives you happiness, sadness, darkness. These were six million people. They were people. These were real people who had hopes and dreams, and they were killed just because they were Jewish, and that's it. A Jewish memorial, but also a message of survival, seen, felt, and heard. The Violins of Hope are touring in the Chicago area and other parts of Illinois through September 2023 before heading to Pittsburgh. And one of the things, guys, that I've read yeah. when we're doing research for this, which is so amazing, is people see stories like this mm -hmm. and then they bring instruments to the collection. So wow. this piece of history just keeps growing and hopefully that might happen with this and then hopefully someone will tell us yeah. about it if they share something. That's, That's a great phenomenal. story. Yeah, and the voices of those, those instruments represent their owners and live on, mm. which is amazing. That was great. Jesse Kirsch, thank, thank you. Jesse. Thanks for being here. Good to be. All right, coming up next, we are stepping into a very special dance studio to find out about a sisterhood built on movement and empowerment. And then later, our new series, Jet Set Today, some hot destinations and last minute deals. If you're thinking about getting away, you don't want to spend a lot of money, we've got something for you. We'll be right back. a sisterhood of women who are empowering each other and bonding one big step at a time. NBC's Blaine Alexander visited the ladies of DSSD Step Studio. This is in Decatur, Georgia. Blaine, good morning. Hey, Blaine. Hey, Blaine. Yeah. Oh, guys, good morning to you. This one was a lot of fun. I think that all of us are safe to say that we've seen step teams. We've been very impressed by them, but we've never seen one quite like this. These young ladies are national champions and they're still in high school. But I think what's even more amazing inside the studio is not what they take with them on the floor, but off the floor as well. Five, six, ready, move. It hits you as soon as you step through the doors. The swag, the precision. No, y'all don't. No, you don't. Because if you did, it wouldn't sound like that. And it doesn't come by accident. We're going to do some sit-ups. We're going to do some push-ups. We might do some waltzes. This is boot camp. <laughs> this is a stepper's boot camp. Yes. 
Welcome to DSSD Dance Studio, the soulful brainchild of Coach Latata Wallace. Tell me about this place, because as soon as I walked in, I felt the energy. I just feel like the energy has to be perfect, not just for me, but for the kids as well. So this really is a sacred space for them. It really is. And for you. And for, and, and for me, yes. <laughs> In fact, it's built right into the name, DSSD, daughter, sister, stepper, dancer, named for the bond that Latata herself longed for as a child. I took everything that I didn't have when I was a kid, I created it here at DSSD. Growing up in Decatur, Georgia, Latata was in and out of school and in and out of trouble. My mother was young, my father wasn't active, I remember more bad than I do good. But in seventh grade, she found her safe space in two very special coaches. Together, they introduced her to the world of stepping, and she was hooked. As I'm stomping and I'm hitting these moves, I'm feeling the positive energy go through my body. I'm leaving the, the trauma and the drama and everything I've been through, like it's leaving me. It was like therapy for you. Yes, it was definitely therapy. Soon, it became her mission to give that medicine to girls just like her. Latata started as a middle school teacher with a step team on the side. It wasn't until she was laid off in 2016 that she pursued the business full time and DSSD was born. Today, the studio has more than 100 steppers, nearly half a million social media followers and enough trophies to fill a dance floor. But her steppers say the real reward is what happens here. What is it that kept you guys coming back? Each the, other. Yeah, yeah the, the team, bond, yeah. the sisterhood. OJ, Alana, and Jamaria have been at the studio from the very beginning. What do you think is the biggest thing that you've gotten from DSSD? It helped me come out my shell. And now I perform in front of a bunch of people and I never would have thought I would have done that. There's little girls that act like me, that think like me, that look like me, and I could be that person to them. Oh, confidence. Because Laura knows I would never be sticking my tongue out every two seconds if it wasn't for this. <laughs> and for Latata, that's what this space is all about. I have stopped a cool kid from committing suicide. Mm -hmm. I stopped kids from running away because I just let them know, hey, it's not cool. I've been there. I've done that. It doesn't mean she's not tough. Latata's standards are sky high. Ready, hit, move. Even with the least experienced steppers. Ready, one, two, three, hit. Yes! What? Latata says she can make a sepher out of anybody. I so I thought I'd put that to the test. That's it, you That's got it. it. <laughs> when those girls walk out of your studio and walk into the world, mm -hmm. what do you want them to take with them? Walk with your head up high, say what you mean and mean what you say, and everything that you do, do it on purpose, and keep God first in everything you do. Guys, I gotta tell you, that is definitely a special place. And Latata is a great teacher. Of course, I learned that firsthand. She knows how to whip people into shape. Now, as you can imagine, there is a lot of interest in her STEP program. She tells me that she plans on expanding soon, and they're even looking into starting a program for boys coming very soon, oh, guys. Wow. I love that. Boy, I, was, I know, I was like rooting for you. I'm like, get it, girl, get it, get it. That was great. Those kids will never forget this class. They will yeah. never forget this program. That was terrific. Thanks, Blaine. Absolutely. Blake. They Thank are a lot of fun. Thank you, Blaine. Thanks, Blake. guys. <laughs> okay, well, coming up, we're going to step onto a plane and plan our next vacation. Some hot destinations and even a sweet last-minute deal in our new series, Jet Set Today. Then later, look who's come cruising oh. into some... Yay! Yes! We're not worthy. Motown legend Smokey Robinson here to perform live. We're going to talk to him as well. We cannot wait. Third hour of today, right back.
This morning, we are excited to launch a brand new series. It's called Jet Set Today, where we give you travel tips and vacation inspiration, and you can shop the vacations we're talking about. It's pretty wild, right? Yeah. Uh, so here's how it works. You scan the QR code to book any of these destinations, and this is a segment that is right on time, because according to our new study from our sponsor, Expedia, Americans take the fewest vacation days annually compared to the rest of the world. 63% of U.S. working adults say they are vacation deprived, but never fear, there's still time to book a trip for 2023. And we've got travel expert Davey Sutton here to help us along. Davey, good to see you. Nice good morning. Day. Good morning. All right, where are we going? I, I, I don't it. understand this. I mean, I, I believe in taking vacation time. <laughs> right. What are some of the reasons people say? You know, one of the obstacles, one of the biggest obstacles still is that there is still uh, labor shortages. Yeah. So people aren't able to find time and then if people are taking vacations, they're using them for sick days instead oh, of going on a trip. Okay. And one of the biggest challenges is that people think they simply can't afford to yeah. go on vacation. But you're we're here to dispel that. Okay, all, all right, right, here we go. Let's dig in here, Chanel likes to say. <laughs> uh, let's let's start with some 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 sun and surf. Let's go to the beach, Davey. Yeah, I'm gonna take, when we think about the summer, we think about the beach and the summer, it's kind of synonymous. Let's go to the Outer Banks, which is in the oh, northern okay. part OBX. of North Carolina. Oh, it's about ooh. 200 miles of, most of it is natural, National Park Service territory. So mm. you can find a lot of remote places. Mm. You can kayak and uh, uh, a paddle board starting at $49. But Ooh. one of my favorite things is the, the uh, Wright Brothers National Memorial oh, is yeah. there uh -huh. where they have the first flight and Jockey's Ridge State Park, which is where you could go sandboarding, hang gliding. Yes. And then you can stay at the Sea Ranch Resort and Kill Devil Hills where you can have access. It's nicely located. You can have access to all of these places. Mm -hmm. And it, people who stay there, they love the oceanfront Beautiful. property and unblocked views starting at $230. That's not bad. Okay. You know, there are a lot of people around the country who don't even know that this is a resource or that this is a place you can go. I didn't even know about South Carolina until I went. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is beautiful. <laughs> right, right. All right. So let's say you're saving some money. You want to splurge with your family. Mm -hmm. You want to go places where there are activities, things for the kids, for the family. What would you say? I'm taking you to San Diego, California. Oh, yeah. okay. It's a great place for kids. We have the new Sesame Place that opened last year, San Diego Zoo. Okay. And of course, the cuisine. It's next to Mexico. So we have the great Mexican mm -hmm. cuisine where you could stay at the best. Bahia Resort Hotel, which is on uniquely placed on the Mission Bay Peninsula. Oh, and just nice. starting at 370 a night, we have access. You can do all the water sports there once you're on the peninsula. And so that's a great place in San Diego to visit. You know, Davey, you kind of uh, referenced this earlier about the cost and affordability. What are some tips for people who are you know, trying to stretch that travel mm -hmm. budget a bit? You know, one of the things that you, people think about is, okay, I'm going to tell you, during the pandemic, peak pandemic, it was all about the wide open space and mm -hmm. the outdoors. And then starting last year, everybody was coming back to the big cities. Mm. You probably saw it here in New York, sure. LA, Chicago. So the second city trend is something that you could take advantage. What's that? Second city is the second biggest city in that state. Oh. So for example, oh. Atlanta, you can go to Savannah. Yes, so it's Savannah, a great city. Yes. Savannah has different vibes. It's that coastal. It has a lot of architecture and history. Of course, the Southern cuisine. We're going to get some recipes from mm -hmm. somebody's grandmother's cookbook. <laughs> and then you can at this cool place called the Alita. This has total vibes. It's in the historic Riverwalk location. Oh. Um, the, the I've, I've stayed there. You stayed there. So you yeah. know, like, it's nice. what's you, every room is different and, and yes. uniquely um, decorated by one of the SCAD art students or oh, the wow. local artist. And you could, uh, the rate to, for summer rates is starting at 280 a night. I love that. Really quickly here, this off, off season tip. Mm -hmm. what, what is the off season tip? If you go to a place in the off season, okay. then you get to zig when every Everybody else is zagging, right? right. So mm -hmm. you get the discounts and less crowds. I'm going to tell you to go to Scottsdale, Arizona in the summer. You're, am I crazy to okay. tell you going to triple digit But it's a dry heat. heat. It, the triple digit heats? No, because Scottsdale's known for the resorts yeah. and the spas. And yeah. you can get a okay. discount staying at the Scottsdale Plaza Resort and Villas for just $134 a I night in the summer. We have like 20 seconds. <laughs> but let's say, you know what? I just want to split. Let's go somewhere this weekend, like now. So okay. a quick deal. What so Expedia has this tool for last minute deals. And I found for you guys, Boston Park Plaza for the next weekend, $279 a night, saving 20%. It was 344. Okay. So you can take advantage of that tool on Expedia's website. Davey, right. thank you so much. Thank you, Davey. Yeah. Thank you and for having me. Learn travel. more about these destinations and book your stay. Scan the QR code below or head to today.com slash jet set today. We also need to mention that today earns a commission off purchases made from this segment, which solely features trips and experiences found on Expedia.
Up next, if you are excited, we second that emotion. Oh, yeah. So there he is, the one, the only, Smokey Robinson. Hi. Right here at Studio 1A, we cannot wait to catch up with Mr. Robinson. And oh, by the way, he's going to perform for us as well. Uh, third hour of today, right back after this. Talk about an icon. Yes. Music series on today is proudly presented to you by City. We are so fortunate to be catching up with a true music icon who's been, <laughs> it's hard to believe, serenading us for nearly 70 years. Mm -hmm. ah. Smokey <laughs> Robinson is known for hits like You Really Gotta Hold On Me, Cruising, and of course, what you were just listening to, I second that emotion. Well, now Smokey is back with his 26th studio album, Gasms. It's his first. In almost a decade. Uh, Mr. Robinson is going to perform a, a brand new song in mere moments, but first, we wanted to catch up with him properly. So good to meet you. Good to meet you. I, I watch you all the time. Oh, oh. Have you I praise. Kevin yes, Bless, yes. somebody's watching. I've been a fan for a long time. Before we dig into the music, though, um, a couple days ago we lost him. another icon. Yes. I know a personal friend of yours, Harry Belafonte. Um, what, what's one of your, your fondest memories of, mm. of your old friend? Um, my fondest memory would be the very first time I ever met Harry. Uh, he treated me like he had known me for all of my life. Mm -hmm. He treated me like I was his son. He was a wonderful, wonderful person. And he was such a great leader for black people, you know, especially during the civil rights movement and all that. He was a very learned man. And he was just a wonderful person. And, and, and I say, you know, even though he passed away at 96, it seemed too soon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. He will yeah. be missed. Let's talk about your first album. Really, in almost a decade, for someone whose career spans, you know, almost half a century, you have over 4,000 songs. We looked at. <laughs> tell not, me, not on this album. Not on this album. <laughs> tell me, tell me why now, for this one. Well, you know, I, I work all the time. I, I, I work on music and and and, and writing. And, and your all poetry, the time. by the way, uh, which I love. But oh, thank you yes, very much. Yes. Yeah, and so I, so I'm always doing that. And it took me about five years to, to compile this particular album. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I, you know, I always work on it. So it, I, was, I was looking forward to it coming out, uh, and I wanted it to cause controversy. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So, so the it, it, it's, yeah, so it's gasm. So. Well, well, okay, so let's 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 examine that because well, there's a lot a lot of folks on the internet are buzzing about this title, but it's you say it's not what we think it is. I, I didn't say that. Oh no, oh, no. Well, that's what oh, it is. What we no, think no, it that's, is. That's, it's that's whatever what I, you it's whatever you think it is. Okay, well, what's it about? What's it about? It's about whatever you want it to be about, Al. Okay. Joy. <laughs> it's about joy. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's about, it's about whatever you wanted to be about, man. That's why I did that. That's exactly why I did that. So Mission accomplished. Form your own opinion. Mission You tell me what it's about. Yeah, Al, you tell me. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's a family show, and I need a job. Uh, oh, that's where you went. <laughs> of course, that's where you went. Last month, you opened up to, to a magazine uh, about this biopic that's mm. in the works. Uh, and I, there should have been a Smokey Robinson biopic a couple decades ago, but there's one in the works. And I was curious. Who would you have play you? Ooh, if you if you had your druthers, who would play Smokey Robinson? I, I, I don't really know that. 
Hmm. You know, because uh, I've had so so many um, different reasons for doing for it being somebody popular mm -hmm. or somebody new. You know, because um, uh, but but I don't care as long as they're they're a good actor well, and, yeah. and, and they can do do the part. Uh, we haven't gotten that far where we would say, well, we specifically want this particular okay. person to to play me. But uh, I just want to be someone who is a good actor. And, and like I said, if it's somebody new. That's fine with that me, That can too. be exciting, yeah. too, yeah. because sure. that's someone's career up. Yeah. Is there anybody out there now that you would love to still collaborate with or work with that maybe you haven't yet? Uh, how, how about anybody that I haven't worked with yet? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> there you go. I yeah. feel like that's how you've worked with so many No, uh, yeah, I have, but, you know, I, I just, I, I enjoy mm -hmm. the work, you know, and I enjoy uh, collaborating with people. And, as you, know, you know, you guys know show business is a small community, mm -hmm. yeah. so you know people that you haven't even met because mm -hmm. you know them through their work, so... Mm -hmm. Anybody who wants to, it's fine with me. Yeah, you know, I, 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 obviously I grew up listening to you, and as did a whole gener generations. And, and R and B, you are the epitome of R and B. But but, what do you think of this new age R and B that's coming out, and, and the younger the younger people coming up, uh, following that 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 legacy? Al, I think what I've always thought about music, man, there's always some good music and some bad music. Mm -hmm. There's always been that. Mm -hmm. So we have the same thing today. We have, you know, some young people out there who are making some great music. Mm -hmm. And I know that, you know, especially when the, when the kids started rapping and they're rapping their lives. You yeah. know what I mean? They're, they're, and it's street poetry and that's what they're doing. And people are putting it down and all that and, uh, because the, the squeaky spoke always gets the oil or whatever. Mm -hmm. that's uh -huh. what saying. Yeah. So they're going to put the whole thing on gangster rap mm -hmm. or, or, on, or on negative music that the kids sure. are making you know a lot of kids out there making some great music man. Yeah. and i know some christian rappers mm. you know what i'm saying right. so so uh I, I think that there's good music and bad music like there's always been We're about to when i was a kid music. growing up and i'm sure you heard this out when i was a kid growing up they say if you play the record backwards you're going to get a satanic message <laughs> you ever hear that <laughs> that's right i never knew how to play a record backwards <laughs> You ruin a lot We're of gonna, needles. Yeah. We're going to hear some great music coming up next. Don't go to work, folks. Smokey Robinson going to treat us to a performance you do not want to miss. Third hour today, right back after this. The oh, Star there we Wars go. kids. I All love right. this. I love this Bring Your Kids to Work Day. This, and they picked a great day to come oh, today. Yeah. In fact, as promised, we are back with an amazing treat on this Thursday morning. We've been catching up with the legendary Smokey Robinson, and now the moment we've all been waiting for, performing If We Don't Have Each Other off his new album, Gasms. This is Smokey Robinson. Oh, my
tomorrow and stay tuned to Hoda and Jenna for another performance from Smokey. Thank you so much. Thank you. And you guys as well. Thank you. Yes. Thank we'll you. be right back. Just throw all the young kids Yay! here. Today. Hey, we got another music icon, Barry Manilow, wow. live in studio. Okay. I love it. Coming up on Hoda and Jenna, Yellowstone star Josh Lucas has a peek at his new movie. Thank you guys for coming. Smile and wave, kids. Bye. Smile Bye. and wave. We'll see you back here tomorrow, y'all. Bye-bye. Bye. Good morning, everybody. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. Oh. You deserve to be celebrated. Way to go, Reynolds. Oh, Al. Y'all love Al Roker. Today, 
Yellowstone star Josh Lucas gives us a sneak peek of his new big screen thriller. Plus, music and Motown legend Smokey Robinson takes us back to 1981 with his classic hit, Being With You. And just like that, Aiden is officially back. We've got a sneak peek that Sex and the City fans have been waiting for. It's, okay. it's today with Hoda and Jenna. It all starts right now. Thursday, it is April the 27th. We are, we are excited. Oh, we are. We are so excited. Today is a great day for many reasons, which we will reveal in a minute. Yes. But. We are excited because another reason why yeah. is that the girls from Sex and the City are back. Come on. The sequel, and just like that, is back for season two. And it's our Can't, can't wait, wait for That. that. Um, because in this preview, we see Carrie back with all of her pals. Yeah. But we also see her back with an old flame. Take, Take a, a look. look. If you're lucky, no matter what life hands you, <laughs> you can always count on your closest friends to be there. <laughs> oh, thank you. My purse was exhausted. Life's too short not to try something new. And just like that, I realized... Some things are better left in the past. But maybe not everything. Aiden! We're talking about it. How about Aiden? Showing he, up, looking better than he's ever looked. On the door, at on, her the, door on the steps step. of that brownstone. The steps where they've had kisses before. Yes, well, unless many. it's her new brownstone, which we don't know. But, but still, it's the whole... Look, Oh they did that God. same thing. You know, here's the thing about old flames. You remember. Yeah. When you see them, it doesn't matter how much they've changed, except for maybe a little. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no matter what, when you see someone from all this, because they're looking at you like you were in high school, college, yes. whenever, and you're looking at them that way. Shared history is such a weirdly powerful thing. And sometimes it's not there again. Like, no. there's nothing. Not even a most, hint. Well, that's what I was going to say. it's nothing. Is there, most people don't have mm -mm. one person that they're like, what if? Right. Do you have right. one? Um, no, I don't think so. That was not enough. <laughs> well, the, you know, you just, you, you make, I don't think there was, I think this is the right path for me no matter yeah, what. Yeah, but was there one that if, if, if one person like Aiden showed up on your doorstep, would there be a, just a moment Probably, of... yeah, yeah, there would be, yeah. There's there just one? Mm -hmm. Just one. Mm -hmm. Just one. Wow. Do you have just one? I don't have just one, but I do have one that I, the relationship was never fully realized. Do you know what I mean? No, <laughs> I don't. What does that mean? Don't make me elaborate. No, 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 but I don't. It just, we never really had the you time. Well, which, which also makes it, when, when something's incomplete, yes. you fantasize about yeah, what totally. it was. You know, it's funny because you can romanticize some 100%. things. Because I asked one guy, I remember one time, like, what was love? What, what's a love that was kind of unrequited? He was like, there was this girl and I met her and it was in a store and we just had this great connection and then I never saw her again. I'm like, that's not <laughs> it. They were like making out in the dressing room. I go, that's, but that doesn't count as, but in his mind, totally. that's the fantasy that lives on totally. and Totally. I mean, this person we dated more than just once in a store, right. but, but still... It, it is, I'm sure it's more fantasy than anything I else. I think so. Whatever you imagine. And reality always is just, you know. Better. Yes. That's what Says I was going to say. Who's been married happily for All right. a long time. We, we know Coastal Grandma. Everyone well, had that. Coastal Grandma it's out? It's over. We can't. No, it's over. It's over. It's rude to say that Wait. to Diane Keaton. By the way, that's a, those are great looks. I know. Those do you wish you had those for New Orleans? looks, kind of. Well, we can still go shopping. All right, but Granny's out, and guess who's in? Coastal, Coastal Cowgirl. Oh. So this is the boots, the Daisy Dukes, the okay. lace, the so sundresses. So what about it makes it coastal, y'all? The skirts? You know what it is? It's easy breezy, they say. Okay. Um, this is something that you probably wore in Austin all the time. Yeah. Uh, a sundress and boots. That's, uh, not, yes. that's not so... Or a hat or, or a something. Or a hat, of course. Yes, yeah. I did. 
Okay. I think I think it's interesting for the rest of the country. That's what most of these looks are. It's like yeah. the rest of the country's like, ooh, let's try that. But even when I sometimes put on boots now, mm -hmm. um, what do you feel it's like? a little, like it feels sometimes costumey even though it's not. Right. It's, they're so, I mean, that's Henry and I. How cute are you two? In boots and a... Oh, and look at your sweet me. And that's oh. me left. So yes, I've worn, wow. Oh, I remember those. <laughs> Girl, you seem to have been wearing quite a few boots, okay? <laughs> Those is... white boots I still have. Do you wear them? No. No, but I should. I should. I'll bring them and we can try something here. I think they're cool, so I think it'll be the next trendy thing. Maybe we'll when see. Eddie dresses us. <gasps> Eddie, who drives me in the morning, who's very, very, very trendy. The fa most fashionable. Most fashionable driver. Okay, he's gonna do it. He'll, he he'll, can do he'll, that's a good grandma. one. All right, so I this mean, is what we've been waiting for. Have you been girl. waiting for this? We've been pausing for this moment because this is the new Read with Jenna pick. Yes, are you ready to hear it? Can we get a drum roll, please? It is Chain Gang All Stars by Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya. He is a debut novelist. He wrote a collection of, of short stories called Friday Black. But this is such an incredible Tell book. Me. Yeah. And the one thing that made me feel like I had to choose mm -hmm. it is that it's not normally something I would read, which uh -huh. I'm trying to do more of. Right, Push branch me. out. Let's yes. come on, let's read things we wouldn't normally read. You can pre-order it now at that, you know, scan that QR code or just go to today.com. Yep. I loved this so much because it, it's set in the distant future, okay? Okay. And it is in a time where criminals uh, are gladiators to fight oh. for their freedom. Oh, Again, geez. not something not I'd normally something we be would into, pick, right? but think Hunger Games for adults with heart and a serious message. It's oh. about how we have become so desensitized to violence, which is timely and true. Oh it's about the prison industrial complex, but mm -hmm. it's also all grounded in an incredibly beautiful love story. Okay. It's a lot. You sold it. But I hope you, you guys it. read it with me, um, and we'll talk about it. We'll talk with Nana later in the, in the month You as sold well. it. All right, guys, today is a special day. It sure is. It is Bring Your Kids to Work Day. So we asked the kids of our staff what they thought <laughs> their moms and dads actually did while working on this program. Take a look. Hi, I'm Ellie. And I'm Daniel. And our dad is Lee Miller, the director of the Today Show with Hoda and Jenna. His job is to work in his studio and do paperwork. But his real job is to yell at TVs. Hi, my name is Henry Johnson. My mother is Sarah. What I think she does at work is come up with an idea, a brand new idea no one's thought about. And then she researches that, like my essay on my book report. And then Hoda and Jenna need to actually like it. Hi, my name is Maya. My mom's job is to tell stories. Hi, my name is Joaquin Quillen, and I'm the son of Allison Berger. She's a producer, and she does all this boring typing stuff at home. She said she's doing work, but and but when she's at work, she, she's like on TV, and it's kind of cool to see my mom on TV. Hi, my name is Valencia. My mommy sets up everything for Hoda and Jenna. My name is Hunter Jones, and my mom's Talia Parkinson Jones, the executive producer. My mom talks to people, and I don't know, where's a headset? Hi, my name is Quinn. My dad is Gavin, or Furface, as you call him. His job is to find people to come on the Today Show, such as Jane Goodall. And, well, all I know about my dad's job is, well, he just parties. We're talking about it. And look, we just look, there are some of our kids here today. There's our director, Lee Miller. He's got his kids in the control Ellie room. Ellie and Daniel. Hi, Ellie and Daniel. Hi, guys. Y'all are so cool. We see everybody here. We're so happy that you guys came. I love that they they don't really know that their parents are the ones that make this show possible. Right, they're just like, it just worked. They re and Jehoda and Jenna have to like it. Clag it, we saw what your son said. Yeah, clag we it, we it. always clag like it. it. We always like it. You wow. guys you guys are members of this family. Yeah, we love you We love you, and luckily we have a incredible leader in Talia who makes sure that yes. all of us put our families first. That's right. So, so we're so happy you're here and so happy our kids are. Uh, <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Okay, coming up next, want to know the secret to cutting a cake <gasps> without any crumbs? Wait, really? Yes. Viral hacks <laughs> coming up right after this. Yay!
Okay, you know we love a good hack, and since there's so many that have gone viral lately, we wanted to put them to the test in a new segment we're calling Can Hoda and Jenna Hack It? All right, so here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna see a video of a popular hack, and then we're gonna try it ourselves and see what happens. So we have some I don't think this table. is gonna be pretty, kid. All right, so first up, we've got a potato peeler hack that will change the way we peel a potato. Let's watch the hack. On Kitchen Facts, did you know the reason why potato pillars swivel back and forth is so that you can not only go down, but forward when you're peeling so that you can peel the entire thing super fast without having to actually lift up the peeler off of the vegetable. Wait, back and forth? We've never done this. Never. Okay, okay ready, see, set, one. one. No, oh. you gotta go back and forth. Okay, I'm doing it. Kind of. Except for it's scary because it's, it's I'm coming I'm at you. Cut my finger Yeah, off. I think the only problem with this hack is you have to is that you have to make sure skill. that you're not going to See, I'd actually your... rather just go like this. Me too. But it does it does do it. Look, it's faster this her way. It's faster, Look. but I'm scared I'm going to cut my thumb off. Okay. You like so it? So it works. Yes. It does work. She's right. All right. Next. Okay. This is a, a soda hack that will minimize the fizz when you pour in a glass. Let's take a look. Okay. So up okay and does this work with beer it's I got wonder. to it's got to okay so you okay. open it up and you put your glass on top you, this is a large and you soda turn it and you just slowly you just let slowly it slowly let it go i think I you have to let i think you have to lift it up you do he oh. was lifting his up but leave the nose of it in the liquid maybe that's it how is yours coming out i think you can just kind of it works it, it works. works. <laughs> Look where the foam is. The foam's in the bottle. I want, oh the yeah, the foam, foam is all in the bottle. That's what they, he figured out. Gavin, you should try that with the Brilliant. beer this weekend. Okay. All right, this here's finally. This one's a hack that will pre prevent crumbs from dragging through the cake when you cut it. Okay, wow. let's watch. Here's something I didn't know until I was in my 30s. Cake is supposed to be cut from the side to eliminate crumbs. Cut from the side piece, cut down. Side piece, definitely less crumbs. What, what are you talking about? We're very confused. And Wait, Hoda, Hoda down. when she watches Hacks, talks to the man like he's sitting right here. <laughs> Plus, these are Wait, huge okay. cake cutting knives. Wait, so what do you mean sideways like Like what? go in, am I doing it right? Okay, this go way? in. Go in. Wow, this is a major knife operation. And then you do it. Okay, and then do, you do it on the other side. I can't believe y'all trusted us with these knives. Okay, okay. and then you just pick Go it up. Go underneath. But I don't even understand what the problem was with cutting the cake. We don't know. What crumbs? Oh my gosh, there are no crumbs! No crumbs! <laughs> but let's try it the other way, just to give the people the, what, what they want. Down. Down. There's still no worked, crumbs. It worked the other way. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that that's such a I think it depends on how crummy your cake is. But I do have to say, the potato peeler, I would have never guessed, nor this pulling, so pouring in the soda. Okay. All right. Coming up next, from riding horses to swimming with sharks. Josh Lucas tells us about his intense new movie and whether we might see him in a Yellowstone spinoff. Ooh, right after this. 
Coming up tomorrow. TV host Adrienne Bailon Houghton opens up about her emotional journey to motherhood. Plus, star athletes Sean Johnson East and her hubby Andrew East stop by. And the boutique owner making prom dreams come true. That's all Friday on Hoda and Jenna. Love Josh mm -hmm. Lucas around here. Not only is he starring in one of the biggest shows on television right now, Yellowstone, he is also in one of our all time favorite movies. You love it, Sweet Home Alabama. We can't do an intro without mentioning Sweet Home <laughs> Alabama. Josh is keeping really busy, starring in a new film. It's called The Black Demon, which follows his character's family as they face the wrath of a mythical shark. Check it out. Josh, wait. Do you save the person or not? <laughs> you gotta see the movies. <laughs> wow. How about the, wait, were, were you weren't really swimming, swimming with sharks, were you? For real? Um, not on that. With that movie was shot, we shot it in the, the there's a crazy big tank that yeah. they make movies in down in the Dominican Republic, yeah. which we were basically attempting to make look like Baja, California, where this story actually is a, weirdly a true story. Well, it's not a true story. It's a, it's a legend in Baja. Yeah. Um, but I have swam with sharks. Yeah. What I, was that I, like? I did one of those crazy shark dives where you go sit on the bottom about 30 feet deep and, and you, you just sit there and you let them swarm around you Wait, and you feed what? them. The crazy thing is they knocked my mask off, so I started to panic. But the thing is, like, that's not the right thing to do. <laughs> did you just um, do it as a thrill or a dare? Or yeah, I mean, why? Was, you know, like, it was that <laughs> thing where you want to try something that is an amazing Never. moment yeah. of nature, yeah. right? Yeah. And that was, I think, the this movie had has, I think, a, a lot of that, and then you take it and make it a megalodon shark and go the opposite direction. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> okay, we have to talk Yellowstone. Please. Because mm -hmm. it is obviously such an incredible part of what everybody's watching. The craziest part is you were in the first four seasons, yeah. but very, very briefly. Mm -hmm. And they ba basically, Nicole Sheridan, it, Nicole Sheridan. <laughs> they, Nicole is Taylor's well, wife. Yeah, the, the but the creator's sorry, I wife. Do know yeah. her too. Um, <laughs> said Taylor said you're going to be in it, but you got to be patient. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had this crazy phone call with him before we even started the pilot, um, where he said, "Look, man, you're not going to do much in the first couple seasons. It's not going to be till season five. And you know, at that point, truly, there was no the, the pilot hadn't even shot. Yeah, right. And so I thought this guy was just nuts um, and didn't really have any anticipation that that would happen. And then I didn't do much, uh, but at the same time, I did become a, a fan of the show, like mm -hmm. everybody, and saw how much you know love and um, how much energy is directed towards those those characters, and it made me want to be a part of yeah. it, you know, again. And then I was sad that I wasn't, and I got this phone call from him saying, "Hey, man, exa exactly what I said. Here we go, five, you know, and five seasons." What yeah. gave you that yeah. like patience to hold on? Because five I seasons didn't... is also a long time on television. So you know, I didn't anticipate that it was really going to happen. I, I just thought, oh, they've moved on from this idea of right. the flashbacks. Um, and, but I did, I love the flashbacks because they tell, you know, a different part or a different side of that family in mm -hmm. a different period. And 
have always had this sort of hope that they'll even explore the relationship before the mother dies yeah. mm -hmm. um, and to see when the family was happy, you know? Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, Josh, we always have a soft spot for you around here because Jenna and I remember way back in the day, I think it was 10 years ago, when we were hosting together, you came on our show, and you came on with the cutest little bundle of joy, <laughs> your little son, and we, I remember this day, wow. and I think you said your babysitter didn't show, but it was such a great <laughs> moment for us. And today happens to be Bring Your Kid to Work Day, which yeah. we thought was kind of cool. How is your son, and does he ever visit you on, on the set of Yellowstone? He's mad that he's not here today, yeah. actually. <laughs> when you ever look since back, that day. Yeah. At that picture yeah. when That's you were a tiny on babe. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. gosh. That's season one, first time I was there, and this is him this year. Season five, oh, uh, trying to take wow. the same What's photograph. What's he like? He's a sports fanatic like I've never seen. In fact, he's such a crazy Seattle Seahawks fan that Rich Eisen uh, found out about it and contacted from someone from the Seahawks, and they brought him on the Seahawks podcast. Wait, he what? did an entire hour talking about the offseason and what's gone <laughs> wrong and the Russell Wilson of it all. And, Wait, and are you a sports fan like that? I'm absolutely not. Like, oh, wow. But he, he sat, yeah, I'm a sports <laughs> fan, but not like this. Yeah, like, totally. He sat there with an iPad with statistics, and Wait, he was referencing what? things and coming up, you know, talking about the draft class. And Is all he going to go into sports, you think? I, uh, well, he wants to be a professional soccer player. Um, I, think he's, uh, I think he's got the talent to be. You I don't do? know if he's wow. going to drive, but I do think he could end up being a sports broadcaster. There's no doubt. He's, oh just well, lastly, before we go, we have to yeah. ask about sweet. Because we Alabama. asked Reese. We asked Reese, could we bring she it back? Said she yes. said yes. So Well, again, we it's think? kind of on her. I mean, look, it's <laughs> what you guys were talking about before. It's that person who's in, in, in the wings, right? Yeah. I mean, I think that's the thing about that story is even though totally. that relationship, obviously, I kind of, I think it haunts them in, a, in a, a wonderful way. And I think that movie, at least for me, kind of has that as well. It does. It's yes. It's got that thing where it's like, Unrequited. You, yeah, totally. you, you want to find that's out, like, yes. what's that person like? I mean, I've barely seen or haven't seen Reese since we made the movie. Oh, um, wow. So we have okay. this, you know, exchange every once in a while, like, hey, listen. Should we, should get we do this it? Back? Stop being so busy. <laughs> That's right. I know, stop the being, answer's yes. <laughs> it's That's building true. an empire, Reese. Let's yeah, exactly. go back. Josh, thank, thank you, Josh. you so much. We appreciate Happily. it. You can catch the Black Demon in theaters. That's tomorrow. Coming up next, the spring style staples you can transform into multiple looks all season long. Right after this. We love you. you need a wardrobe refresh. So today we're going to show you 10 style staples that'll help you create a whole bunch of different spring looks. Okay, here to show them to us is style expert Melissa Garcia. Melissa, Good let's morning. start. Hi, Melissa. Hi. First of all, are you into cowboy coastal? I am, as a, li a little bit. A little you know, bit. not too much, a little bit here and there. Right. Yeah, you don't yeah. want it to look costume. costume. All right, exactly. let's start with the dress. We need a staple okay, first. Okay, so a little black dress. We always want yeah. one. This one is great, and I love it for many reasons. First of all, it's affordable. It's from Abercrombie. Adjustable straps, comes in tons of colors, regular, petite, tall, it's just a little tons of sizes. Dress. And you can dress this up or down. You can wear it with sneakers and a jean jacket. You can wear it more elevated with a statement earring and a heel, a red lip. Like, ah. it's really that kind of dress that can do so much for okay. you. Okay. And then, of course, 
course, we need a great layering piece for okay. spring. I love striped sweaters we're seeing so much of. We saw a lot of it in the winter, but yeah. it was like chunkier knits. That's interesting. Now, now it's lighter. It's a nice crisp white. And again, you can wear this. It gets chilly at night. Layer this over a tank top. Did you top. wear it over that dress? Or? I did wear it over you the dress. Did. Yeah. And it did. gives it a different look. This kind of looks totally. like Coastal Grandma, which is still It in. does look a little like yeah. Coastal Grandma. We did that segment here. Yeah, that was fun. Sure and what is that? A is that a jacket or a button it's down? It's a denim a button, button down. down. It has a little Western feel, yeah, right? Like, it definitely has so a little bit in. of Western. It's, it's in, again, but like a touch of it. Not too much, not over the top. And again, super versatile. You can wear it open, closed. Who you makes this shirt? This one's from Mango. Okay. Again, okay. and all like under $100. Okay. Jeans. We need a good white jean or white White pant. jeans. Instead mm -hmm. of like regular blue jeans, white jeans are just crisp for spring and yeah. summer. They just look fresh and intentional and polished. These are from The Gap. They're a barrel style jean, which is kind of like a great in-between between a skinny and a boyfriend jean. They're a little bit more fitted, but they still have a little bit of loose bagging. Is that a bagginess. capri or is that for a small person? They're a crop. They're, okay. <laughs> I, I these tell. were the ones that I actually wore, you'll see. So they're they're petite, okay. clearly petite. for me. Yeah, okay. you're petite. <laughs> yes, you are. Yes, yes. Right. What, what about, what about these pants? linen? Pants. We're I seeing tons those. of trousers. Love. Yes, we're seeing this everywhere. Super slouchy and casual. Mm -hmm. These are that. linen yeah, blend. What top do you wear with that? So this is great. So you can wear this elevated with a heel and maybe like a tank or a blazer, yeah. or you could wear it casual with a t-shirt and sneakers, Cute. like yeah. white sneakers. Cute. And then the ultimate layering piece for we spring need a is trench. a really yes. Like breezy, flowy trench goes over everything. Not from so a dress, structured. Not so structured, mm. just really flowy. I love that. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. sometimes I have a really structured. Yeah, and it's hard. It feels to, like not it's comfy. uncomfortable. It feels All right, let's talk accessories. Okay, so really fun accessories. So for bags, we saw little itty bitty bags for so long, not practical. Nobody so now wants we're that. seeing a trend for big, oversized bags, mm -hmm. which for us working mamas, this is great because you can throw so much in here. And we're seeing denim too, maybe from the Western inspired yeah. trend. This we're is all really happening. A lot of Denim. <laughs> We're seeing a lot of denim. Sunglasses, rectiles, rectangle style. Yes, we which are fun. Rectangle, yep. let me see. Yeah. They, and they yeah. actually work cute. well you on. Like yeah, you're looking. You look yeah. They look good on all face shapes. They work good on all face shapes. Kind of 50s inspired. Kind of a little bit, yeah. And these are $15 from H&M, super affordable. Earrings, we're seeing these long, really shoulder skimming earrings. I'm mm -hmm. wearing a pair too. They're fun, they make a statement, they're not too heavy. Yeah. These Cute. happen to be from Mango, really affordable. And always a great baseball cap we're seeing, or have like a street style kind of cool vibe these days. Yeah. So if you're having a bad hair day or you just want yeah, to Yeah, I like that. Yeah, easy. For like a weekend, practical. it's great. Well, you know what you did? You took the combinations and put them together I so we can see how it will all work out. Take a look. This was fun. I had fun, and then you guys worked your magic here and put it all it's together. Funny. Oh, cool. Oh, I like and, that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you put, see, look how cute. Oh, look. you drape it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, and that's under. It. How many oh, different outfits is it? Wait, what? I think we did 11. 11 outfits? I think we did 11, yeah. How cute. Yeah, super fun. Aren't those pants awesome? Yeah, they're awesome. I love the pants, pants with the so trench. Good. And you're right, I'd like Look it. at the black. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and there's the sweater it. Oh, you threw it over. It. There you go. Super oh, and you threw the jeep. Wow, Melissa. Yeah, so That fun, was awesome. Right? I can't believe you did all that with just these few things. I know, but I got. love how everything was just really classic. It goes together. Yeah. The classic piece. Signed in uniform. Melissa, all right, thank, thank you. you. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Speaking of style, the Met Gala is around the corner. we got a podcast to help you get your fashion fix and more entertainment coming up right after this.
Okay, if you cannot wait for the Met Gala on Monday or the King's coronation next weekend, then listen up. Our pal Holly Palmieri is the program director, the host of today's show, Radio on Sirius XM. She's got the perfect podcasts from pop culture to wellness. Hey, girl, hey. Hey, girl, hey. Okay, let's start with the Met Gala. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know there was a podcast for no, that. absolutely. It's coming up on Monday, the Met Gala. The theme, Karl Lagerfeld. Of course, we're honoring his life and legacy yeah. and career. I know we'll be talking about it yeah, on we'll Tuesday. We'll be talking. But Vogue's podcast is already talking about it. They have a great one, the run-through with Vogue. Choma and Chloe are the hosts. Oh. They really go inside the Met Gala behind the scenes. So if you're a real fashionista, you'll love it. But even if you just like to flip through Vogue, I think you'll really so enjoy it. they look always, like fun. Always on yeah, the oh, Yeah, it really so is. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, well, if, pretend you're not into couture, but yes. you want to just sure. still get into fashion Absolutely. and all that. Absolutely. We love Katie Serino. You probably yeah. saw her Instagram. She has this hashtag, supersize the look. She's where been she on will, show. Yes. Yeah. I like her. And she'll take celebrity styles and sort of make them approachable for everybody. What is her podcast called? Okay, it's called Boob Sweat. Boob Sweat. I know the name's funny, but. But it's brilliant. It's her three-part series that I'm loving right now. Okay. It's all about, like, the growing demand for inclusivity in retail, but, like, why are retailers failing at making yes. plus-size clothing? Yeah. We actually have a clip of the series. Okay. Do you think people in retail really understand what it's like to have never been able to shop in a store other than a specialty store? The things that fail the most in fashion and any sort of marketing campaign come down to the fact that the representation was not in the room when the decision was made. By the way, so interesting. That, that works for every single yep. industry that you're in. Yep. Yeah, the second episode is out right now wherever you get your podcast. All right, let's talk about King Charles's coronation. We know that that's coming up early May, May 6th. If yeah. you are obsessed with the royal family, check yeah. out Royally Obsessed Whoa. with Rachel and Roberta. They are so fun. <laughs> they have so many fun facts, and they're always spilling the royal tea. Are they British? No, they oh. are American, but they might as well be British. Yeah, totally. They're honorary, oh, I believe. They they're heading off to the coronation, oh, but a new are. episode drops today. Today of Royally Obsessed from our friends at Pure Wow, and we have a clip from last oh, week. Oh, good. I just want to say while we're sipping, we need to pour one out for the talent booker of the coronation. <laughs> yes. Pour one out for this poor person who cannot secure the talent. I know. What we're is going talk on? All the about concert. that. Oh all my about gosh. That. All the reports are saying that they cannot get anyone to say yes. And the reports are that Harry Styles said no, Adele said no, the Spice Girls are a no, which would be Which is bummer. devastating. Oh my gosh. I really was holding on to that one. They wow. got that royal but Katy Katy Perry and said Lionel yes. Richie said uh, yes. People yeah. said yes. Yes, They're of course, of yes. course. All right. Um, okay, what about another um, recommendation that's fit for a queen or a king Ooh. who doesn't have much time? Well, yes. podcasts are tough if you only have a short amount of time. You don't have yeah. 20 minutes to listen to an interview. Yeah. Palace Intrigue is a cool one. Oh. It's a daily show that's only five minutes long. So if you subscribe, it goes right to your inbox, and you just get the quick hits, the headlines. And, and, it's, and it's all about royals, too? Yeah, and it's really for the American audience, which I really like. They don't use the royal title so much. It's just like, here's what Harry and Megan are up to, uh, so it's a fun. Well, you know who does use the royal title? Who? Uh, Keir Simmons. He actually has one, too. Yes. Right here. Yes. Born to rule. We love that Keir Simmons. Keir's. Really looking forward to hearing more from Keir. All sure. right. What about some pop culture news? This is from Andy's channel. Don't we love radio, Andy? I, by the way, yes. I just saw Andy in the hallway the yes. other day. <laughs> Holly was there. We were literally in hysterics. At, at serious. At serious. I was walking through doing an interview well, with Lord Gurr, he, and he walked through. It, he was like, girl, let's dish. Sit <laughs> down. <laughs> Did he talk about any of the band? Your pump gossip? We got a lot. Oh, well, if you're into gossip, you're going to love this one. Yeah. Lauren, Rachel, and Mariah. Yeah. They are content creators, writers, producers, and they are real life sisters who oh, host a radio oh. show together, The Smith Sisters, mm -hmm. on Radio Andy. And it's a live radio show. And Hoda, you know I love a ride. And radio yeah. show. It's you can about call pop in. Culture with pop the culture vibe. news. And you get to call in and participate in all, all the conversation. Mm -hmm. We have a video of what oh, it's good. like to be in the studio with The Smith Sisters. Cool. I feel the same way. Like, I feel like even as obsessed as I am with Megan, with Harry, with Kate and Wills, with Harry Styles, all of these jokers, I no, named Harry Styles like he was a royal. <laughs> I'm sorry, did I miss something? I meant to say the queen. The queen. <laughs> I mean... I oh my gosh, them. hilarious. I would listen to that in one second. Me too. Both. Okay, talk about wellness and health. Yeah. yeah. What's a podcast for well, that? When you're done binging the Webby Award winning Making Space with Hoda Kotb, if you're looking for another, we love How to Be Fine with Jolenta and Kristen. So they have done the research on hundreds of self-help books, and oh. they do the, the practice that these people preach. Cool. Like using ice baths, for example, which even Carson now has in his basement, you know? So last week's episode was all about ice baths, and we have a clip from that. 
This flyer is from 1722, and it's on the history and benefits of cold baths. And it claims that icy plunges can successfully treat nightmares, leprosy, plague, female complaints, hysteria, gout, constipation, blows to the head, cancer, and even flatulence. Apparently, I need this because I am a female and I complain sometimes. Uh-huh. Oh my gosh, that's hilarious. So they do what they actually go in the Yeah, and today's episode report. is about lucky girl syndrome, so I say we put that to the test. Yeah. Oh, oh that was gosh. awesome. Holly, you Holly, always you bring the good. Great job, great Thanks. job. All right, coming up next, we're going to sing along with a music legend. We have been waiting for this. The one and only Smokey Robinson. He's going to perform a classic hit, Being With You, right after this. He's our favorite. <laughs> The City Music Series on today is proudly presented to you by City. Sing it. That smooth voice is the (laughs) unmistakable one of the legendary Smokey Robinson, who is credited with more than 4,000 songs spanning more than 60 years. Now the king of Motown is releasing a new album tomorrow full of original songs. It's called Gasms, but today he's got a special treat for us. Smokey is singing. Wait, she just said the name I of know. your album. I, why, wait, why now for the album, and why did you choose that name in particular? I chose a name to cause controversy. And, that, and, that's and it what, worked. That, yeah, that's what, that's what it's done. We heard the so. internet broke. Yeah, oh, you broke oh, it again. Yeah. Oh, right. Breaking it. Yeah. Um, performing, you've performed, uh, we, we've watched you obviously over the years what is it, how is it different performing now? I, I just love it more for the fact that I'm still here and still doing it. So, yeah. It, it, yeah, yeah, I do. I have a great time. I have a bunch of great people with me here. Yeah. And uh, we have a wonderful time. This is my family. So, uh, Are there any artists that you're listening to that you love right now? You're like, yeah. A bunch of them, honey. Yeah. I, I, I don't even, even want to name You don't want to names. single them out, yeah. make the others feel bad. Right, because I have to run into those people. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to perform for us, Smokey? Uh, we're going to sing Being With You right now. Oh, oh yes. Because we're happy being with you. We're so happy you're here. <laughs> Thank All you, right. Smokey. <laughs>
amazing. Thank you. We love you, Smokey. I love that, you was back. You that was amazing. That was incredible. Smokey's new album, by the way, drops tomorrow. Yes, Make download, sure you download it. it. Download it. You won't forget the name. And we're back right <laughs> after what this. Is it again? Gasm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Just a reminder, today was Bring Your Kids to Work Day. All of our wonderful kids who we are here. They've been on camera one. They've been producing. They've been directing. Thank you all so much. We love you guys. Y'all put Tom this show together. You did. You saved us. Tomorrow, Olympic gold medalist Sean Johnson East and her husband, former NFL player Andrew East. Plus, we're going to talk motherhood with singer and TV host Adrian Bylone Houghton. All right. And two high schoolers get their prom dream dress ready. No, we we all say wait. this together. One, two, three. See, See you Friday. You get stuff done, okay? You get stuff done. Has that been kind of the secret sauce? Because you're not here by accident, obviously. You're a talented human being. You've got all the things going for you. But how much did that play into your success? I am goal-oriented. I am solution-oriented. I don't get stuck in a problem. I like to, you know, figure it out. And I feel like when you can figure it out, then you move a lot faster than people who kind of get stuck. And I used to, when I was younger, I would definitely get stuck. But I think um, being in the industry kind of teaches you that, you know, survival of the fittest and the only way you kind of survive is by actually doing the work and getting stuff done. But it means you gotta be confident in your voice. When did that come to you? I think I didn't know any different when I st started working first because I was 17 or 18, I was a teenager and to me, it didn't matter when I got paid. I was just happy to get the job. I was really happy to be in the mix. I was really happy to get, you know, I was learning the craft. I'd never been to school, acting school or anything. So, you know, my, my observations were just, you know, what is everyone else doing around me? How can I learn? And I think that's something I still have. I'm a student of life. I don't expect that I know everything. So when I ask for something, it never comes from a place of, even now, it doesn't come from a place of I expect this done. It comes from a place of here's why it needs to be done. Mm -hmm. You know, this is I come with reason um, because I don't like being told no to. So I, I, I make the situation such that it's hard to say no, where I'll be like, this is why it's necessary. Here's why we should make the change. 
Um, I'm never con like I never I'm not someone who likes conflict. I love collaboration. So I always make it um, so and and that started very young. I, I feel like when you give people instead of I learned and I tell young girls this specifically girls, um, but mostly for young people is confidence is is not it's, it's self-taught. Well, talk about, I mean, self-confidence from being a kid. I mean, you came to this country, I think you were 13. I mean, most 13s, there's no more awkward or insecure or scared time in your life than that, that little window right there. Yet somehow you had the moxie to come here. You had the moxie to say, I want to try this. I mean, that's, that's big confidence for a kid that age. It was, I don't know if I had the confidence. I think I just didn't know any better. I was just really excited about going to America because to me, American high schools were like, you know, Beverly Hills 90210 or like Saved by the Bell. We had to wear uniforms because the socioeconomic background of most children is very different. So to create uniformity in school, it's mandatory to have uniforms. Whereas in America, you could wear whatever you want. Plus, I was also in a girl's school till I was in the 12th grade. So the added benefit of, you know, being around boys was very enticing at that point. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It, I'm, so wait, were you, um, I was always embarrassed about boys and dating at that age. I always wondered, would anyone even look my way? What did you feel like when you were that age? I liked looking. I didn't know I could do anything about it, <laughs> but I kind of like, I was, I went to boarding school when I was in second grade, third grade. My mom sent me to boarding school because my parents were, they had just, um, you know, exited the army and they were setting up their own private practice. And when I went, I went there as a baby. But when I came back to my parents' home and went back to my school, I was like, I'm a woman. You haven't, you haven't lived, you still live with your parents. I went to boarding school. I lived by myself. I had this like, with my classmates, I had this crazy sense of confidence when I would tell them what happens when you don't have adults supervising you. And they used to look up at me as if I had had this magical experience at Narnia, which was inaccurate. I just kind of made it up. And I realized, I think, you know, looking back, I think a lot of confidence comes from, I don't like to say fake it till you make it because I don't believe in faking anything. I think talking to yourself and having a dialogue with yourself, which hypes you to be what you need to be, is a very healthy thing. And I think in different phases of my life, I kind of taught myself or learned how to be my own hype girl. And it kind of helped me navigate many really crazy situations, like especially coming to America at 13. And Did you have uh, friends? Did you feel a part of something or...? Eventually I made friends, but in the beginning, like the, this is the first, like say three or four weeks when I didn't know anyone. And I used to just, the vending machine was easy. I preferred my own environment because I just didn't understand how to navigate hallways, how to find homeroom, how to go to a cafeteria, how do you grab a tray? All that was new for me. So I think I observed for the first three or four weeks and then I got the confidence because I had seen and what kids do I got the confidence to walk into the ca cafeteria and I was like all right now I know what to do I'm not going to look like an idiot did you ever feel I mean I felt this way when I was in school for much of the my life my parents came here from Egypt and they wanted us to be red white How and old blues. Were you? Um, I was born in the states but they came here as newlyweds and my brother sister and I were all born here but somehow you always are kind of different. Like I remembered playing spin the bottle when I was probably in sixth grade and I was praying it would land on Todd and it did. And when he looked at me when it landed, he said, I think that's going too far. And I'll never forget it. It was like a knife in my heart because I had dreamt of that moment. But it kind of reminded me that sometimes you aren't quite in with the other kids and that kind of underscored it for me i didn't know what your experiences were like in school did you feel like you fit or not no i don't think i i didn't think i ever fit and i don't know if it had to do with me being indian or it had to do with me being non-american i think that's kind of what it was i was an immigrant kid um i spoke differently I tried to fit in a lot. I changed a lot of my identity when I was in ninth grade to kind of fit in. I I was in Queens for a short, a short period, like a couple of semesters because my aunt who I was living with was moving around and 
living in New York just in ninth grade made me realize that the world is not just one type of people. There are so many different kinds of people. And then after that, when I moved around, I kind of had an arsenal of that, you know, if you're made to feel isolated, it's not kind of true because Queens was like this incredible melting pot of like people from Ethiopia to people from like Afghanistan to like, you just act in my own block. I met like people from everywhere in the world. It was incredible, but I never felt like I fed in, fit into school um, because I came from a conservative family. You know, we, my family wasn't about, you can go out at nine, you can date boys, like that stuff didn't exist. So, and that was very different. And I had to kind of explain it, why I can't talk to boys. So that would be really embarrassing, even though I was someone who liked the attention, even though I was someone who liked to wear makeup and I would come back home, um, dressed in whatever I went to school in. But when I went to school, I would change it to like the shortest shorts of yeah. the crop tops and, you know, do all of that stuff. But trying to fit in is such a big part of being a teenager that I think I did the same thing. But I I remember my crush was Seth and he had green hair and this was me and, and he never knew I existed. I may have mustered up the courage to say hi once. And that was the only time he looked at me and he just smiled and walked away. But I was, he was never in my league. And I, I absolutely understand what you felt. But the fact that he smiled at me or even looked at me when I said hi, or I think I passed him a pencil or something, he was in front of me. But he looked at me and my day was made. There's so many things that shaped you and formed who you are. As you're talking, you're someone who uses your hands, and I love that. And of course, you've got a tattoo I see that says, Daddy's Little Girl. And I was thinking about you and that moment and what an impact your father has had on you in your lifetime. And um, I often, I, we have a lot in common. My dad passed away, too. I was much, I was in college when it happened to me, but I remembered thinking like, Thank you. I remembered wondering one day, and I asked myself this question too, what did you lose that day? So what, what did you lose the day your father passed? I think I lost my greatest cheerleader. I felt like that for the longest time. And don't get me wrong, my mom was cheering me all the way. And, you know, she handles my whole life when I'm out to work. Like she's with the baby right now when I'm talking to you, you know, and makes my life completely amazing and has been my mentor from when I was a kid but my dad was my cheerleader he was he used to get so excited if I ever won an award if I signed a new movie he was my hype guy he would love just standing and watching me be you know on set just being me he just loved that he, he would just want to be around to watch me do what I do and that was um a very isolating feeling when he left. I kind of was very disoriented. I felt like, you know, I, I I don't know how to cheer myself on. I didn't know how to get excited. I went into a really dark place because I was very, very close to my father. He was, and he 
cancer is a really bad disease. It it to see the deterioration of a human being. And my father was a defense army man. You know, he used to wear his you know uniform and ride in his bike and handsome, tall and life of a party. And then to see what that disease did to him in his last few days kind of really broke me as well. Um, but I felt like I had lost my ch cheerleader. I think that's what I think I lost that day. Um, a lot of us go through life and we always compare someone who we fall in love with with our fathers. It's just, it's, I think it's a natural way that we go through life. You need someone who measures up somehow. Well, look at you. You found this wonderful, wonderful man. What was it about him and what is it about your, your love story that you think makes this so magical and makes it work? He's my cheerleader. He's the most secure man I've ever been with. He gets extremely excited at my wins. He takes off my extensions at the end of the night. He um, fixes my dress when I walk off stage and makes sure it looks right when I'm on the carpet. He brings me my coffee first thing in the morning. Um, he's all the things that you know, a girl dreams of and you kind of never end up having it when, you know, you have all of those aspirations and you're let down. But my husband is the kindest, most generous, gentle, thoughtful man and also extremely intelligent and patient. He's just so even tempered, can handle any kind of thing thrown at him and also has the ability to be vulnerable with me honest and vulnerable about his fears, um, about, I, I think, just having the honesty to be able to say anything to your person and know that that's, nothing can faze them and that they're, they're still with you and will still grab your hand when you walk out the door, no matter what happens to you, is a very safe feeling. And I feel safe with my husband. It's a, it's, I, I wish that for everyone. Mm. I feel like sobbing right now, although I'm not going to because it would be weird. But it's, but by the way, that's so beautiful. And what I like is whether love takes time or whether love happens in an instant, when you know, you know. And you guys were like whirlwind city. And here you sit with a beautiful baby and a beautiful relationship. Uh, you know, I guess yeah. just the way it was Our intended. Our relationship has only evolved. You're right, because we didn't know each other very well. We didn't know each other's lives and temperaments but we knew that there was something that just drew us together we wherever we went we just kind of we were just drawn to each other we did i knew him for almost two years before we started dating and i mean i've said this before but honestly i didn't give it much of a chance because you know i was like he's 25 years old he's a rock star like i want to get married i want to settle down i want to have a baby i was 35 at the time and i was like I've been there and done the fun thing. Like now I'm in a place where I wanted stability. And I just, I didn't give Nick enough credit till I went out with him on our first date. And then we spent like the whole evening together. And I realized my husband is just like an old soul. He's, he's stability in human form. <laughs>
baby malty, which is like, I don't know how you can improve upon what is it. It looks like a beautiful, perfect life, but that's how you do it right there. That little baby, first of all, that baby tested you. When that baby came into the world, it was scary, and the baby needed love, care, and all of your prayers and everything. What were those initial days like when Malty was born? This is another really amazing example of the strength that my husband has. I kind of like shut down. I, when we heard, I just, I didn't know how to react. And I remember he just held me by my shoulders and he said, and I said, just tell me what to do because I don't know what to do. And he's like, just get into the car with me. Just change, get into the car with me. And we drove to the NICU. I mean, we drove to the hospital. She was born. And from the moment she took her first breath to now, she's never been without one of us, ever. We used to divide our days where, so that because we were both working, uh, if I would take the morning shift and stay in the ICU with her, for like six or seven hours, we used to do skin to skin because uh, the nurses, I mean, in a NICU, they did God's work um, and they really encouraged us to be very hands on with her, even though she was so tiny. She was in the hospital for about 110 days. Uh, and and then Nick would come in the evening and I would go home and then he would spend like five, six hours with her. Um, I don't think it was our test. I think it was her test. I realized very, very early that I did not have the luxury to be scared or to be weak because she was scared and she was weak. And I had to be her strength as her mom. I needed to make her feel at every given moment that she's not alone, that she has someone who can handle her, that we've got her. And that's all we did. And we prayed and we were there with her every single moment. And today she's the greatest gift of our lives. And <laughs> just like my whole life, our whole lives revolve around her. Oh my gosh. I love the name Malty. That just come out that's of That's my mom's blue. middle name. That's your mom's middle name. Oh, oh my God. It's my mom's middle name is Malty and his mom's middle name is Marie. So she's called Malty Marie. Malty Marie. How beautiful. And she's with you right now. Yeah, she's asleep with my mom, actually. <laughs> of course. I love the idea that she's, she's never been without you. When you finally were able to bring Malti home out of the NICU into your house and you were finally a family in, a, you know, in, your, in your home, in a normal setting, what was that like for you? Oh, it was terrifying because I was a... Being a NICU parent, you really get used to the monitor and NICU parents watching this will understand that. Like, you know your child is alive because you can see their heartbeat. I couldn't sleep for days because now suddenly she was home without a monitor. I used to, like, put my ear on her chest. I would wake up every couple of, you know, minutes to just see if she's okay. For weeks this went on um, till I found a camera that could do it. <laughs> And then I was like, hi, I can sleep better because I can see her heartbeat. <laughs> wow, I love it. You know what? It's so crazy when I think about your life because it has all the facets. Um, you are a beautiful mom and a loving wife. And then in the show Citadel, you're like kicking ass. Like every woman is like, yes, like I want to be, I want to have that kind of moxie. I mean, is there a part of you who has that kind of stuff inside you like your character does in citadel did you just throw a knife at me i think so i i mean i like i'm i'm from the land of india i'm from the land of gandhi i believe in nonviolence, but i could take i could take someone on i'm i'm pretty sure of that i mean you're strong <laughs> you. girl that you're you're strong too i mean how do you have like seriously the time to do all of the different things how how do you parse that out I used to burn the candle on both ends. I won't lie. When I first started in my 20s, I'd never even taken a vacation for 10 years because, you know, I was greedy. I was like, I want to do everything. I don't want someone else to have this part. If I, I, if I would make schedule my days in a way where I could do four movies a year because I wanted to do everything. I was just hungry. And then slowly I realized that that just chipped away at my soul. 
I started, I didn't know who I was. I didn't have preferences, likes, dislikes. Everything was just my work. And that's fine because I'm extremely blessed to have an incredible career and uh, for almost 23 years now. And, uh, you know, our jobs are not the most stable. Like, I don't know where, you know, as an actor, you don't know where your next paycheck is coming from. You just have to get to the next job. So I've, I've managed all right for almost two decades. But in the beginning, it was crazy. After that, in my 30s, I think I realized that the thing that they say about work-life balance actually is a real thing. And now I've reached a point where I work till it's bath time at about seven o'clock. And then after that, I'm not available. Um, that's my time with my family. We do bath time, story time, bedtime, and then it's Nick and our, my time, whether we go out, whether we have friends over, whether we just sit together and watch a movie, like having family time is, it just makes me want to do and conquer the world when I wake up and do a million things. And I can do that really well because I know that I come back home to my family and that just it's such a priority to me now. your spirit I love reading I love traveling when I travel I love observing I love culture um you know they say when in Rome I really am a believer of that wherever in the world I go I eat local food in every country I go to um and I'm kind of training my daughter how to do that too she's extremely um her palate is very global um from Korean barbecue to pasta to Indian food. She's great. Uh, but my spirit gets filled with people, travel, culture, laughs, jokes, community, good times, a table full of food and family and friends. It's truly what fulfills my soul. But also being able to go to work and, you know, when people watch my work for them to say, wow, I can't believe you did that. Even after all of these years, I, I get, I work it, it's the most satisfying thing to me when my work is appreciated by the people that I work with and the audiences that watch my work. Like, that really fulfills my spirit because I put a lot of myself in my job. You seem so comfortable in your own skin. Like, you know exactly who you are, you know exactly what you, what you want and why you want it. Um, being comfortable in our bodies is some, sometimes a different thing. It takes years sometimes. Some people go to their grave and they're never comfortable. They just want to be in a muumuu -moo and hide. Um, when was when was your most difficult challenges with your body and what you how you perceived it and how do you feel now in your own skin? I mean, I think the thirties were kind of tumultuous for me when it came to my body. Um, you know, because as a, as you grow, as you know, your body's changing. I was going from this twenties teen like body, which is you know metabolism is at its highest, and then you reach your mid thirties and you're like, oh. I can't skip a meal and it'll just look great. Like you can't do that. You can't just work out for four days and come back to your, um, you know, pre-vacation body. <laughs> but um, I think that 
you know, the standards of beauty in the industry are, especially for women, extremely skewed. And I've spoken about this tremendously. Um, but I would, I think I, my dad passed away. I had moved countries. I'd come to America. I was filming Quantico at that time. I didn't have many friends. I was in New York. I felt a lack of community. I would emotionally eat. Um, I would just emotionally drink. I would, I wasn't taking care of myself in the best possible way. And it had nothing to do with how people perceived me, but I perceived myself as not the best version of myself. And it was a really tough time for me to be able to like say, all right, I'm going to, you know, do what's good for my body because emotionally I wasn't there. Um, and, and I think that's okay. I've, I, I've, I've thought about that phase in my life a lot and my body needed to mourn, my heart needed to mourn and yeah, you know, I needed pizzas to do it. So I allowed myself to do that pizza and a bottle of wine and a movie, you know, my heart needed it. I did it for a while. And then I reached a point where I knew that, you know, bottom had been hit and now the only way was up and I started taking one step another step, you know, maybe going to the gym two times or maybe even walking for breakfast or starting to find my health again, my mental and physical health, trying to reach out to friends. Friends had stopped inviting me to things because I would never go. I just wanted to go home and just hide. And then slowly I would say yes, or I would reach out to someone. I started choosing myself instead of the darkness that is productive and that kind of reaches out for you sometimes and that can happen to anyone anytime as soon as you choose what's good for you and w stop waiting for somebody else to be you know that hand to pull you out of it it's a very powerful thing you're unbelievable i swear that was so awesome we're crying over here okay we're crying over here we have people in our room crying Priyanka, thank you so much. Thanks for the time. Thanks for staying up late. Thanks for being amazing. Thank, just thank you. You know what? I would love for you to join me. Uh -huh. You should. <laughs> Four months ago to the day, Janet Jackson invited this girl from Wichita, Kansas to be her backup dancer on tour. Well, you didn't have to ask me twice. I am hours away from hitting that stage and living my best life. That's right, I am on center stage at the Hard Rock Live in Hollywood, Florida. Hey, baby, it's Janet. For Janet's opening weekend of her Together Again tour, her first major tour in four years. When fans from all over the country and different cities come to see the show, what do you want them to feel? Joy, just complete bliss, excitement. I want them to reminisce about great times in their lives when this song comes on, that song comes on, just happiness. And not to be corny, but it's been such a long time since I've been with the fans, so this is, this is for them. On that note, how do you feel, especially with a tour like this? Is it exciting? Is it challenging? Is it exhilarating? Maybe all of it? It's all of that. It really is, especially getting the show together. I love production rehearsals. When the stage is up and we get to do the wardrobe changes and really, really dig into it. And I didn't get as many days as I would have loved to have, so we did like one full dress rehearsal literally the day before the, the day before the show and they worked out fine and then they went to finish for the for last night's show i was just about to ask you janet what is it about being on stage and performing that you love i enjoy it i enjoy dancing i enjoy performing for the fans i enjoy just sharing what i've created i love putting a show together creating it with gil gil dual de Lau, and it just gives me so much joy and to say look look at what we've created and i hope that mm -hmm. they enjoy it knowing that i like it and i love performing it hope they enjoy it watching it we have so many you know songs that fans love but is there any song in particular that I guess when you look out into the crowd and they're singing it back to you, that you feel most connected to them? Oh my gosh, there's a, it's a couple of times in the show that it happens. 
But I think one of, one of the nicest moments for me is uh, when I when I I do again, and um, when they sing it to me, mm. and I, I love that I can hear them, and and that sounds so beautiful to me. Them knowing that melody, thinking, oh my God, how many years ago was it mm. that that I, I I wrote that song, and and just listening to them and. A melody that you've come up with, and lyrics that you've come up with, that you've created, and and having this group of people just singing it back to you. you know, I, 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 I love that. It, it's just it's beautiful. Is there anything that you do uh, before you hit the stage? You know, when you perform or a ritual? Or is there anything that you say to yourself? Or? Always pray. We as a group, we always pray, and I myself, I always give it up to God. Mm. I say, God, from this 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 point on I said it's I'm releasing it to you it's it's in your hands and and that's who I trust the most by the way I should mention we're uh, you're letting cameras kind of follow you around for an upcoming documentary you're still developing this but we know it involves family this yes. tour family the tour there are some surprises I think it'll be uh, quite fun I, I hope that the audience enjoys it. And I'm, I'm so thankful that it was as, as successful as it was. You know, you're just moseying along for five years and talking about your life and friends and family and work and this and that. And, and it, was, it, was, it was difficult at times. At times it was a breeze, um, very uh, cathartic, therapeutic. <laughs> Uh, it's like you were in a session at times, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I enjoyed it. The press release that they sent out with this new one, it has a picture of the family on the front. It talks about the family, you know, back together for a reunion. Do you think there would be a time when you guys would perform together or I get on a so. stage? I hope so. Why do you think now is the time uh, in the season that you're in in your life now to share a little bit more of you or to share some of those things? You know, I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm I'm not as shy as I used to be, so I'm a little bit more open and just sharing more in my life than I ever did before and having a, my own family now and allowing to people to see and understand how we came up and what really was, what really happened and how it came about and maybe to help others who want to follow along in that path. That's the key. I mean, even though it's a different time now, but still you can take and learn and this and that and apply what might work today with what happened then. I love that. Do you think yeah. people, or do you feel like your fans really know you? Or is there still room for us to get to know you? I think there's still room, a little bit of room, but they know me sometimes better than I know myself. <laughs> so we're also celebrating 50 years of your career in mm -hmm. entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember when you were on the Today Show, I told you, um, I talked about the power of representation and the impact you had on, you know, especially brown girls like me growing up in Kansas. And I was thinking about it, I mean, from acting, you know, we saw Penny, you know, on, on Good Times, different strokes. And the then, kind of family yes, that I did with yes. Eileen Brennan and Rob Lowe and yes. Telma Hopkins. And then even on, obviously on the singing side, you were cranking out hit after hit after hit. At the time, did you have any idea the impact you were having? No, I was just doing what I loved and, and just thankful to God that I was able to do it. No, not thinking of that at all. I was just going and being excited about, okay, what 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 I'm going to do next, what, what what excites me to do next, what influences me, what what moves me to do next. I wasn't really thinking about that. You can be called many things, a singer, Grammy winner, actor, producer, fashion icon, philanthropist, mom. Is there any title that you hold at the top of the list or do they all have a place in there? I think they all have a place, but the one that gives me the biggest gratification is mama. That That's goes it. without saying. I said, Mama. Janet's son, Issa, just turned six in January. What is it about being a mom that just completes you? Everything. Every, every, when you're tired, when you need a break, I just love it all. I love it all. When, when you're in that moment, you see something special happens. It's like, oh my God. And I know I'm going to remember this for the rest of my life. Sorry, I'm getting emotional because I'm thinking of one thing in particular. 
And I'll never forget it. And it was just so beautiful. And I just thought, that's my baby. That's, that's. You're making me emotional. Because I get it. I have three little ones. It puts everything in perspective. That's the highest for me, being a mama. Okay, okay, so finally, let's talk about tonight. But me being here all started with good old fashioned <laughs> Today Show Halloween. Can I tell you what I was thinking, Janet? Tell me. Okay, the whole time I was like, I mean, I don't think Janet Jackson would actually be watching the Today Show, but if she is watching the Today Show, I just don't want her to be like, ooh, would that girl please sit down? <laughs> no, you know, I saw this. No way. Yeah, I saw this and I loved it. I saw this and I absolutely loved it. I thought you did a wonderful Thank job. Thank you. Okay, so Miss Jackson thinks I did a good job, but I had a month to rehearse that. I now had to learn a new routine in just hours. To help me loosen up, Janet took me to look at her tour wardrobe. These are the costumes for the show. Wow. Um, is it heavy? No, this is light. Valentino did this for Ooh. me. This is light. This is my opening cat suit. They did this cape. Pia Paolo did. This is heavy. It makes me feel very, very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's beautiful. And he also did, how gorgeous is this? Mm -hmm. I would wear this. Can I wear this? Yeah, once I finish with <laughs> okay, it, good. sure. There you go. <laughs> I need it until seriously, then. Seriously, like the shoulder, like the cut of it. It's beautiful. Oh my gosh. It's beautiful with this, this skirt. Ooh. Look at that. And then the inside, Ooh. it's so, it's beautiful. And it's, it's, it's got weight That's to it. I was it. about to say, it feels kind of yeah. heavy. And then, Christian did this. Christian Soriano did this for me. Ooh. This the more a little lighter part of the show. Love. And it's uh, he did it so quickly and it fits so nicely. It just hugs your body and easy to dance into. And Ooh. Chris John, he's been a friend of mine for a good while. Mm, mm. Chris John Louboutin. And yes. he he, I just called him up and I said, Mama needs some new shoes. I mean, if Mama <laughs> needs new shoes, these aren't bad. Do you ever want to keep some things? Like some of these, I would want to keep. Like this, or the boots, it's, it's or... beautiful. Or well, do you I, let I, it go? Well, when I did the auction, I let everything go, but there was one thing I, I didn't let, let go. What was that? And that was my our, our original, original. I had two original Rhythm Nation costumes. Mm. And one of them that I wore, I let go, and the other original, I kept from my baby. That's worth it. Oh, baby. that's sweet. And if if he wants to throw it out, He's then he can. Janet had calmed my nerves from an 11 to about a 10 and a half. It was time for her to take me to meet my fellow dancers. This is our path, as you see all this 
glow tape in there. Is it crew at least guys. a little lighter than this at, when you're doing no, this? No, it's darker than this. Oh All you see are silhouettes. Ooh. Let me sit out. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna, as All you right. say, release you uh, into yeah, the wild. Into <laughs> <laughs> Give it up to God the way I do every okay, night. Okay. It's in his hands. You'll be fine. Thank you, Jane. I'm, I'm a step okay. out. Okay. All, All right. right. Have fun. All right. But right now, fun yeah, was feeling nine, more nine, like one. fear. Yeah, but good. I had to put those nerves aside. Five, six, seven, eight. Lost it a bit. Hey. Just and then I found out Janet wanted me to come out hey. during Together Again, the encore song. Crazy! This was huge. She trusted me. I had to nail it. I just go upstairs and practice that little thing. I spent the next two hours practicing in my room until it was showtime. And suddenly, my nerves melted away, and I just embraced the magic of the moment. And the next thing I knew, I was dancing with Janet Jackson. Go on, Sam! All my love's for you, always been a true angel to me. But just like her music, Janet just wanted me to smile to the very end. Savannah, you got to catch up with one of probably your most favorite people, Miss mm. Kristen Chenoweth. Oh, she's a legend. You yeah. know, she was just down the street. She met us at historic St. Patrick's Cathedral. Honestly, we could have talked for hours. Kristen, of course, needs no introduction. She's a Tony and Emmy winner and has transformed Broadway with her starring roles in Wicked and You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. Well, she credits God and her faith with helping her get to the main stage. And as a Christian, she believes it's her mission to share God's love. And whether that is on the Broadway stage or walking down the streets of New York, she's finding a different kind of voice. I can't believe we're here. Can you believe we're here? You got your start singing in church. I did. Not a church like this one, though. Oh, no, no. Uh, mine was in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and it only had about 1,000 people in, in membership. But God was a huge part of my life. How I found my gift was through church music. What does it feel like to sing a great hymn, like How Great Thou Art, and be able to sing it like you? I feel, <laughs> thank you so much, you make me cry. It's, it gets me back to my roots. Whenever I sing, you mentioned Great is Thy Faithfulness earlier, and I, Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, I just, the echo. Morning by morning, morning new, new mercies, mercies I see. Take my mic down. <laughs> Never. You have a song in your heart, and you should sing it. Maybe not as loud as me. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not as loud as you. I'll lip kidding. sync. Would you say you first found your voice in yeah. church? I was in the choir, little kids choir, and my, they were having an audition for an adult solo. And my mom said, you can't, you're a kid. I said, let me just go try out. You know, that says a lot about me at that age. So I went and I got the solo. They were like, we're gonna give it to you. And then that Sunday I sing the solo and 
the church erupts. And I say this story only to tell you that when you're a little kid and the encouragement you get from people that love mm. you to follow the passion that you love, I was given an opportunity to sing about something that I believe in, which is faith, mm. and do it in front of people who love me, a very safe space. It started the ball rolling. And I love to sing for all kinds of faiths because I believe that we, we worship a God that is loving, not one that is man has made so you're going to hell mm. and a loving God. And if I can spread that joy, then I'm gonna try because that was one of the things God told me when I was a little girl. People go, oh, he actually, he spoke, hey, Chris, you know? Yeah. I get these impressions mm. on my heart. I don't know how else to explain it. It's a still small voice. And when I get that impression, it's like a handprint, like, yes, that's correct. It's interesting about God's voice because um, it's hard to describe, although actually I think you describe it really well. Thank you. But I often find it is saying something that is unexpected. Yes, yes. I remember Savannah even talking about my adoption. And I've just started talking about it recently because, because I got the impression in my heart, this will help other people. People need to know that you just weren't in, in this world magically. They need to know what was behind it. It will inspire people. And so it's become a lot more easier for me to talk about. But if I couldn't listen, I would have kept that secret. And I'm not ashamed of it. Kristen was adopted as a newborn. Her adoptive mother happened to be in the hospital the same day she was born for an operation that would leave her unable to conceive. By chance or heavenly plan, Kristen unexpectedly became available for adoption. She said to the doctor, I always wanted to try for a little girl and now I won't be able to. And he remembered that story. So when my birth mom, Mama Loon, came to give birth, she, they called my dad before and said, do you want to surprise Junie tomorrow? Because I've got a little baby here that's going to need a home. And my dad said, yeah. And so they kind of took my mom, robed her up and day of her surgery and took her down to the babies. And they said, see that baby? That's your baby. So she's waiting on you when you get done. And so we went home together. And she said, I always felt like I had you because we went home together. And I mean, how can I, me personally, not believe in miracles? Mm. I got the perfect family. I was brought into this world by the wonderful mother, Mama Lynn, and I was able to get an education. I grew up in a loving, giving family, one full of faith and a lot of fun too. And, you know, it's a gift. It's a gift, so that's a miracle. But how does Mama Lynn, did she sing? Yes. Okay. And the, my birth father was a great musician as well, mm. Billy Etheridge. And some people might know who he is out there, but so I know where it came from. Mm. And she's petite. I got her height. People say nature versus nur mm. nurture. I think no, nature and nurture mm. is what it is. It's such a beautiful alchemy, this story. You know, it's <laughs> like this magic. It's divine. It's divine. It's divine. You've had ups and downs in your career. You talked about how you've looked for God's voice yeah. to guide you. Yeah. How has that helped you make decisions that might have been a little surprising at the time, or a little unorthodox or off the beaten path? It's been really interesting because I have a, a wonderful team that works for me to help me guide with these decisions. Even when I was younger, I was lucky enough to get a great agent. I went to New York with my friend Denny to help him audition and get settled in. And I thought, maybe I'll just try out for something for fun, have the experience. And I ended up getting this part. And I had a big decision to make. And this is where I talk about the gut. This is where I talk about that impression. Some people call it the universe, that's fine. For me, it's the Lord. But I have to get quiet. My whole life I've heard from my aunts and my mom, two ears, one mouth, Kristen. Two ears, one mouth. <laughs> Speak less and listen more, because you know I can talk. <laughs> And when I do that, I'm able to kind of hear what God wants for me. And I went to New York. I said, I want to do this thing. And it worked out. So God has other plans sometimes. And it's happened several times in my career. But faith is a journey and not always an easy one. 
Along with great success, Kristen has had great setbacks, including an onset accident that nearly killed her a decade ago. Severely injured, the road back was a crucible. It was horrific and scary and awful. Now, I could go in the path of bitterness and anger, and I did for a while, I did. But I could let all that go. It happened. So guess what I'm gonna choose? That way. And a lot of it is up to us. He gave us a mind and for me to just, I don't guess I'm preaching, but for me to talk about that, that'll be something I really want people to know. Have you ever had doubt, seasons of doubt, or disconnection with God? Yes. The big question of why God me? Yeah. Why me, God? I've had several injuries. You know, I'm in a, I'd like to say I'm an athlete. All my Broadway people know what I mean. People that tour, they know what I mean. I asked my mom one day, this was after this accident. I had to kind of relearn how to get some of my sentences out, land the plane, so to speak. I, my physical, physical body is not the same as it was. And I had a big pity party. And they, were, they stayed with me for three months to help me walk and things. She said, why not you? I said, what do you mean? Like, I'm crying. She goes, of course, do I want this for my daughter? No, but why not you? You know better or worse than anybody else. Things happen to everybody. You're on a mission to spread the love of God. I mean, that's it. Wait, that's you know, but also when you do fall and you mess up and we all have, you get this amazing gift, which is God's grace. It's an incredibly bonding experience with God. When you know you did something wrong and you feel that on your heart, you are forgiven. I mean, you're so right to bring that up, grace. Growing up, my mom always said, Junie Chenoweth, I love you. She said, uh, if you want to be forgiven, you have to forgive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's hard. It's hard. And it's later in life because I'm a Leo and I'm very loyal and I expect it back by people that love me. And when I've been hurt in the past, I have held on to it and it has hurt me. So just recently, this is a, a fact. I've started forgiving people that I feel have hurt me that don't even care anymore or know about it because <laughs> I'm the one that's hurting. And that's God's grace. He says, see, my child, if you'd done this the whole time, you wouldn't have carried that, that on your journey. I think that's so unique to God's character, if you will. When he tells us something, even something we don't really want to do, like forgive someone who hurt you. Yeah. He's not doing it for them. He's doing it for you. Yeah, it's true. And I've had tro more trouble, Savannah, learning to forgive myself mm. when I have disappointed others, disappointed myself. Mm. I'm very hard on myself. Type A, your average nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> but guess what? Learning to forgive yourself is the most important so that you can move forward. 
at my church, the pastor says, one way to define sin is just the way we fall short of love. Oh my gosh, say that again. Sin is just the way that we fall short of love. And I think that's a more accurate way to describe it yes. and more matches up with what, you know, what God intends. I agree. I so agree. I love that. I'm going to remember that in my head because it is all about love, isn't it? Yeah. We don't have these conversations all that much. Not anymore. And there's a way to talk about it, I think, in love and openness without judgment or some kind of, I don't know. Cutting think, off? Yeah. Closing down the wall? And you know what it comes down to? We're all God's children. I know. Everybody gets in on it. It's, it's, I think if we thought about that more, yeah. it would be transforming. Then we really would be look at each other as brother and sister instead yes. of the enemy. In this family together. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what God wants us to do. Don't you, Savannah? Upon this rock. So on this day, Kristen Chenoweth, who God gave the voice of an angel, raised hers loud and strong, and we were blessed. I won't let her throw her life away. We need to trick her into dumping him. As much as this will pain us both, we have to call a truce to make this work. You have to be in lockstep. Hey, did you make a pact to not murder each other until you murder me first? We are here for you, my love. Yes, we're in lockstep. Yeah. Ticket to Paradise is Julia and George's first romantic comedy together and their sixth collaboration. You clean up pretty good. It's a friendship that has spanned two decades. So you guys, when you say you're friends, it's more than friends, really. I mean, you have a lot of friends in Hollywood, mm -hmm. I'm sure, but this is this sounds like it's definitely next level. Well, we've been friends a long time. Yeah, a long time. She, she comes over to the house in Italy with the kids and stuff, and we've had, I mean, you know, we've been together, we've worked together a lot. Yeah. I got to produce a film that she was nominated for an Oscar <gasps> for. And, oh, I no. was in the first movie he directed. Yeah, how, how is that being directed by George Clooney? Yeah, come on, how is that? <laughs> You know, it's interesting oh, because, <laughs> no, I'm going to say this. I remember something so clearly because it's like, there's, I think it's the, my opening scene and I'm sitting in a, a booth at a restaurant and oh, yeah. I have this big hat on mm -hmm. and red lipstick. He was very specific. Mm -hmm. I loved how specific he was and clear. I mean, that's what an actor wants more than anything mm -hmm. is just like a clear, understanding mm -hmm. with the director of what they want and what is expected. Mm -hmm. And and he just would see me as just an actor when mm -hmm. we were at work oh. and talk to me as an actor and have these expectations and it wasn't it wasn't that same like 
just casual. Right. Oh, hey, Jules, why don't you do this? It's a, it was like, okay, I want this to be just like this. Wow. And, you know, and it was really, it was really special. Was and fun. I also, that it was his first movie and that I got to be a little part of it, I felt. It was fun. It, yeah, mm -hmm. it really. It was, we had a really good time. We did have a good time. Um, this whole movie, obviously, is a movie about parents who are upset that their daughter is marrying someone who they don't think is right for her. Um, and <laughs> before they even meet him. Before they I even meet him. Say. Yeah, <laughs> everything was too fast, too far away. Like I was, uh, I was feeling the parents in the beginning. When you saw the script, were you like, "We, this is us." We both said, "Well, if, if you do it, I'll do it," because mm -hmm. it's sort of the oh, these really the only way you could see it working. But it was, I mean, it's a miracle that it all came together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, best part about working with Julia Roberts on this movie, go. <sighs> the money. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I will, I will be honest, which I don't yeah. like doing. I, he doesn't, and I don't like when you are honest. You don't like it, because I'm, I'm nice sometimes, and that's a terrible. Throws uh, She's a great friend, and she mm. is, you know, on top of all of the things that we all know she is and everyone knows she is, she also is a very, very good friend. And so it's really fun to work with people that, uh, that are truly good friends. And uh, Julia, best part of working with, uh, with George on this movie. Now, I've cornered you now. Yeah. I know, you have cornered me. I'm going to say this, because George and I, um, we have, I don't like to say that we're very much alike, but we do have the same, like... Beard. <laughs> <laughs> How much time do we have here? <laughs> We're gonna get like three and a half questions out. Um, we have the same energetic spirit yes. at home mm -hmm. and not, I said that, like we live together. We <laughs> do live together, which is a very weird for my wife and Danny. <laughs> but at work, we both really like a joyful, exuberant yeah. work experience. And we, we take that sort of leadership very, seriously mm -hmm. in a way to be to be relaxed to make other people relaxed yeah. and and happy and so being together on set is such a in a way it's a continuation of our of our real life together yeah. which is just singing songs and carrying on and i don't know how y'all didn't crack up through each take i mean i watch you two and the banter seems like it's happening in that moment you learned that to make me look bad you don't need my help there. Uh, are y'all ad-libbing some of that, or is it all? Not much. Well, no, we, had a, we had a fair amount of ad-libbing, <laughs> especially in the drunken scenes. Yeah. But what it would be, too, is when they would put us with a group of people, like at the graduation, where oh, we sort disaster. of have an yeah. audience, yeah. then we can't be stopped, because we're trying, we feel it's our responsibility to have to sit there all day to entertain them. And so we yeah. had a different searing joke at each other yeah. Yeah, there were, there were a couple where, you know, you, you do it, and then we both stop and, like, go, is this the step too far? <laughs> this is too mean. And we finally ended our friendship. <laughs>your first impression once you saw it all come together I thought you know it just felt like a salve oh. an hour and a half yeah. salve
I remember you saying to me though, when we saw it, and you go, "You're so mean to me." I, I was what? shocked, actually. Really? I was real. I had yeah. forgotten how really some of it was kind of searing. Ma'am, I need to sit somewhere else. I'm sorry, it's a full flight. We used to be married. The worst 19 years of my life. We were only married for five. I'm counting the recovery. And yeah. because I've gotten away from it and George hasn't said anything <laughs> mean to me in a week, I was like... I could do it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are the meanie parts, which are fun to watch, and there's also the kissing part. Is it awkward to kiss your dear, dear friend. <laughs> it is when my wife and kids come by to visit me. That Wait. was the first day they came to visit. It's like, Papa, oh, Auntie Juju. It's like, ah, get him out, get, get him out. out. <laughs> it's really bad. What's what are you doing, Papa? What is that? <laughs> no, they didn't, they no, didn't see they it. Were, they were Who wants ice cream? <laughs> yeah. Do y'all laugh when you're kissing? Is it funny yeah. or is it, are you trying to? Yeah, we <laughs> laughed. It was funny. Wait, Julie, it was laugh. <laughs> Yeah, it was. It's, it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, yeah. because listen, you know, it is like kissing your best friend. And well, then, thanks for that. And then, you, you know, know, I was a, you know, I was wait, a two times sexiest then man alive. You go, alive. wait, my best friend's George Clooney. Yeah, come Maybe on, I man. Better tune in a little bit, and but then you just can't. <laughs> my favorite. <laughs> Boy, you really, you really helped I'm my sorry. reputation. What about from your end? From my end? Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> I didn't really kiss from my end. I. You we were doing it right on the lips. Um, Open that door, Hoda. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we, uh, no, it was fun. Look, I, you know, we knew what we were going to yeah. do. We knew what the job yeah. was, and yeah. it's funny. Yeah. We were very professional. But it does make you laugh. Guys. And that was the day, too, that it, the first time in my 30 years in show business, I had a 3.30 call. Never. 3.30 a.m.? Uh-huh. Is, that's when you get up every day, I know, isn't it? That's our yeah. speed. So okay. wait, what was it? This yeah. is not my speed. Yeah. And I'm an early riser. And yeah. I was like, 3.30, are you sure about this? Yeah. Because they wanted the sun to be rising oh, while we were kissing. kissing and this whole thing. And so I think it was also a, a ploy of all's. He thought if we're exhausted, if he has us tired enough in that moment we that we around. might be serious. Yeah, he was wrong. It was beautiful. By the way, my favorite part of the movie, so many great parts, but y'all with your drunky monkey dance. Dad, please stop doing that. Ooh, yeah! <laughs> People are looking! <laughs> was a I thought 10 there was some, plus. I thought, come on, I thought that was some good dancing, didn't you? Yes, I did. I mean, you know. I kind of did. I was kind of into it. Those were our moves, man. Uh, yeah. For real? Well, yeah. actually, well, if you think of it, like about 20 years ago when we were doing Oceans, uh, we had a party, remember, in, yes. in Vegas? Uh huh. Pretty much the same moves. They were the same moves, to different effect, and yeah. we were actually drunk. Y'all yeah. <laughs> did look drunk in that yeah. thing. It looked like you were really putting them down. Was there any ounce of those drinks that were actually real beverages? Uh, no. No. I've never done a, a film with Julia that I was sober. <laughs> I don't think ever, really. It's hard, you know. We, They're like, you're going to kiss Julia. <laughs> just leave the bottle. <laughs> just leave the bottle. Um, no, it, there was no drinking, although yeah. when we watched it, we, we thought we were. We, I was really impressed with how drunk and loopy and I, I think that was some of our best acting. Well, the young kids just were so, it was, they were shockingly well, embarrassed. The first take just, watching us, because all was like, Okay, I'm not even going to pretend to tell you guys what to do. Just, yeah, just stay watch. in this area, yeah. and uh, and we sort of took off. And they were like, they were stunned. They were paralyzed. We and we thought we were really funny, <laughs> and they didn't. Remember, they were just kind of staring at us like we were in the zoo, and we were like, pretty funny, huh? And they're like, oh my god. Like, You're like, <laughs> you know, they're rolling a camera on you guys, right? <laughs> Everybody's going to see it. Dinosaur move. I am praying. Yeah. For an asteroid. They can see what it's like to get old and it's terrifying them, you know. <laughs>
you've got twins that you have that are, don't tell me, did I read right? They're going to college? Well, they are seniors in high school. They so, will be 18 in November. Oh, my word. Yeah. How are you feeling about that, your kids going off to college? You know, I, mm. I have feelings about it. Yeah. Mm. And, but, you know, the nice thing is, is that the five of us in my family, I think we all have very similar feelings about it right now. Mm. So it's not like, you know, it's just I can't me. Wait to get away. Yeah, it's not like just me going, oh my gosh, That's you guys right, are going yeah. off to school. I think everybody kind of feels like, wow, these, we can recognize these moments together as, as these really big page turners, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's nice that we're having that that experience together. And speaking of twins, your, your twins are five, right? Five, yeah. Did I read that they are now speaking um, Italian, Italian, French. You, how, Italian and French? Yeah. What are you doing teaching them this all kinds? Of stupid. <laughs> I mean, honestly, this, I've done dumb things in my life. We all know that. This is the dumbest thing. But it's so, it's, it is astonishing. Tell First us. of all, they're such lovely kids. Yeah. They're just so sweet, lovely kids. And my kids, yeah. you adore know, them. Adore them. Yeah. Because they're just these little sweet balls of mm. hilariousness, especially yeah. Alexander. And, but if, if, if I speak Italian and George speaks English and you're one of George's kids, they will speak in Italian and then speak in English and then speak in Italian and then speak in English and yeah. go back and forth. And it's like, wait, do you speak all those languages? No. <laughs> it's a disaster. Every time they, and, and they talk to each other in Italian when I'm talking to them, I'm like, what do you, what? What'd you say? So you know it's a conspiracy. And it's a twin thing anyway. Yeah. Like aside from this, the language thing, oh, it's, it's a twin it's, thing. This has been a disaster for what's happened. Do you know you are sitting next to a man mm. who has never been in, in an argument with his wife? Mm. Well, I've been that, in wait. an argument with you though, so yeah. it works out. His but, work wife. <laughs> but is, do you find that like shocking? No. You don't? I don't. How, you tell guys me. don't fight. Because I don't fight with you my husband You don't fight either. with your husband yeah. either. They don't fight. How do you resolve conflicts? Like how do we you- We just don't fight. It's just not how we communicate with each other. It's not, yeah. it's never been- Your language. Called for. It has never been our language but you just have ways of resolving conflicts and you ask through just regular conversation and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know. Well, I also think, you know, every once in a while, luck plays in a, a part in all yeah. this, you know? I feel very lucky that I met Amal and I feel very lucky, sort of late in life for me, that, uh, you know, the things that you used to as a young person, you know, guys in particular, I think you would defend in a way that you don't have to when you're older. You know, I know how lucky I am to be with them all. So mm. if we're going to paint the wall yellow, uh, and I think it's a really dumb color, who cares? Who cares? And when you're 28, you might, and you, you want to fight about this. So, so many things in life that I think when you're young, you would fight about, you know, when you get old, like Julia, um, <laughs> you don't fight so much. <laughs> <laughs> I think having kids, I mean, I have obviously kids later in life too. I've got a five and a three year old. Yeah. I feel like I'm a different parent than I would have been. I feel like I am, um, I feel like I'm just a better person. I get scared sometimes if I'm being totally honest about mm. being my age. You do. And sometimes I get afraid about what's ahead. Like sometimes when I think about milestones, I just hold my breath and think, please God, like, let me, I want to, I want to witness that. Yeah. I want to see that. Do you ever have those? No, I things? kind of like the idea of being sort of out of it when like <laughs> my daughter starts to date. I'd like it to be like, huh? <laughs> she huh? Huh? I think I'm be comfortable with that. I really do. Papa, I want you to meet, he's a drummer in a band. Huh? I like toast. Uh. <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> um, no, I think, but here's the thing. The truth me. is, because yeah. we all, no matter how old we are, George mm -hmm. being the oldest of us, um, it doesn't, you know, they have chosen us in this oh. moment to be their stewards and their shepherds in this life experience. And, you know, it all happens when we're ready. I met Danny when I was ready. You met them all when you were ready. Mm -hmm. It's like... And then we call these children into our lives when we're ready to best partner with them. And so I don't, I mean, sometimes I get gripped with fear mm -hmm. of blowing it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I've just said to my kids like, so today me as a mom, can we just 
can we just take that off the board? Erase it. Because I, I blew it. Yeah. You and Bono would talk about his kids, and he said, you know, I had a conversation with once where he said, you know, they're like 15, and yeah. he said, now we're about to get to the age where you're just gonna, for no reason at all, hate me. <laughs> you're gonna hate me for like five years. Yeah. I'm just gonna, you're just gonna be against me. And he goes, and then you're gonna come back and you're gonna think I'm kind of cool, and we're gonna mm -hmm. get along really mm -hmm. well, and we're gonna have a great life. He goes, can we just skip those five <laughs> The middle years? part. I like that idea. I do too. I think there are so many parts. I mean, I don't want to dwell on parenting, but I'm just kind of in the middle of it. And since I'm sitting with both you guys, I feel like there are certain, I have certain things I try to teach my kids. And one of them is when they don't know something or they feel stupid, instead of saying, either ignoring it or, or saying, being embarrassed about it, mm -hmm. I, we have something that we say and it is, I guess I haven't learned that yet. Ah, mm -hmm. and that's nice. Yeah, I just, it's like a small thing, mm -hmm. but little bits and pieces. Are there things that you've tried to teach your kids that you hope that they will carry with them as they like head off to, into the world, into college? Well, I mean, <clears throat> my kids are a little older yeah. and I mm -hmm. feel like the one thing that we've always tried to instill in them is to just remember who you are when you're out in the world. Mm -hmm. Remember that you, as one person are representing five people mm -hmm. and just to conduct yourself in that mm -hmm. same way that you would when we're all together mm -hmm. when you're by yourself out in the world. So, and I think that's, not only does it make you feel like you're not so all alone out mm -hmm. in the world, it does kind of remind you to just be that much more thoughtful mm -hmm. or that much more helpful mm -hmm. if you can be. Beautiful. Nice. George, about for you? I guess I haven't learned that. I knew you were going to say it. I was waiting ah. for it. Oh, I love that you did it. Okay. You're going to tee it up for me. I'm going to take it. I just knew it. God, I love this friendship so much. Okay, so we looked up your zodiac signs. You're a Taurus. You're yes. a Scorpio. Okay, so here's what it says. They're really weak signs. <laughs> <laughs> they are opposite signs in the zodiac, giving them a special complex connection. Mm. They can combine to make a whole, each partner's strength balancing the other. Quiet, quiet, okay. quiet. Taurus, and, Scor <laughs> Taurus <laughs> and Scorpio have tons in common, but because their personalities are both so powerful, mm -hmm. they often swing between passionate love and passionate disagreement. Mm. Do you huh. think, is there any truth to that? There was till the end. I don't. <laughs> we don't we don't, dis no, we don't we don't disagree. disagree. We the only things we disagree on is one for the road. <laughs> no, one time I got up, I had to leave <laughs> dinner. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what are you gonna tell? I don't know. No, what story one time I had up. to leave dinner because I had to work the next yeah. day, yeah. and we're all sitting there at dinner and we are having a beautiful dinner and drinks and having this great time. And I said, I'm so sorry, I really have to leave. And I get up in this nice restaurant and I start walking out. And George goes. Quitter. <laughs> Julia Roberts is a quitter. <laughs> yeah, you gotta throw her under the bus every once in a while. Yeah. You know, somebody uh, has to throw her under the bus. Everybody's like, oh, Julia. You know. So no. that would that's be, what you do. Those are our disagreements. I love that. Do you all think you'll be working again at together in a movie? <laughs> it's not gonna happen. I've learned my lesson. You know, it took five or six times, but I've learned. You yeah, know, no. No, no. <laughs> Meanwhile, he's put me in his contract. He can't live without me on the screen. Uh, of course not. Yeah, why not? She's also the best available, you know, really. <laughs> available. I love you guys so it's much. Thank you. you. It's so take fun a nap to, now. I know. It's fun to watch. <laughs> we wear you out.
high-profile movies are just now being rolled out. Among the first is the romantic comedy Notting Hill. It tells the story of an unlikely romance between the world's most famous actress, played by Julia Roberts, of course, and a shy London bookseller, played by Hugh Grant. The thing that is so irritating is that now I'm so totally fierce when it comes to nudity clauses. You actually have clauses in your contract about nudity? Definitely. You may show the dent of the top of the artist's buttocks, but neither cheek. Or if there's a stunt bottom being used, artist must have full consultation. You have a stunt bottom? Well, I could have a stunt bottom, yes. Wow, and are people tempted to go for better bottoms than their own? Yeah. I mean, I would. Julia Roberts, good morning. Nice to see you Thank again. You. Welcome Thank back. You. Thank you. Gee, what original question could I ask you? You play a world-famous movie star, Anna Scott. Could you relate to her? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Julia. People don't realize we just had this conversation. We were chatting <laughs> yeah. about this. Well, people don't probably realize that you've been asked over and over again about the parallels between mm -hmm. this woman you play, who's gracing every magazine cover in the world, mm -hmm. and your real life. Yeah. Um, when you were first approached about this, I understand you thought the idea stunk. And yeah. then as you read the script, you thought, I could really do this. What was it about the script that make, made you think you could take the plunge? Well, because I felt that the story was so beautifully constructed, and I felt that really the idea of her being a um, famous actor was just a great contrivance to show real extremes of people's lives and and how to make things that are so drastically different work because I think these two characters are different on so many levels culturally and just sort of their upbringing and all that separate and apart from their jobs they really are I mean she's yeah. like the princess of popular culture he hasn't heard of anything I mean he's been basically living under a rock a few of the things I was like, oh, come on, you've heard of that. But he really is sort of disengaged from what's going on in the world. Yeah. But I just loved it. I loved it. And Richard Curtis is a brilliant writer. And he really constructed a story that I just felt I wanted to participate in telling. He wrote Four Weddings and a Funeral, mm -hmm. right? And, and a lot of the movie really is sort of um, ensemble acting. Mm -hmm. Was that fun for you, working with these actors? Well, it was fun. It was um, a daunting, in a way, because we'd all be you know, sitting around this table. And I'm telling you, English people can say anything and sound clever, charming, <laughs> and, and just so smart. Right. And then I would sort of open my nasal mouth and be like, <laughs> What are you talking about, you know? <laughs> and every time I get my heart broken, the newspapers splash it about as though it's entertainment. <laughs> and it's taken two rather painful uh, operations to get me looking like this. Really? Mm. Really. Mm. <laughs> no, nice try, gorgeous, but you don't fool anyone. <laughs> Just to sit there at that table and sort of watch them each have their shining moment was so exciting as an actor just to witness. There is sort of a moment of truth there about celebrity and I'm sure you've been talking about this ad nauseum and about some of the downsides of, of celebrity status. Mm -hmm. um, do you think a lot of people though will see this movie and obviously Anna Scott is experiencing the downside of, of being famous but they might kind of say <laughs> boo-hoo? Well I kind of said boo-hoo to her. Um, but at a certain point, you have to realize that she's doing the best that she can. And if the best that she can do is to be a little whiny or to not take the highest road with the situation, that's okay. I mean, it's not my place. It's not, it, it's just not anyone's place to judge her experience because I think where she's at in her life, she hasn't really come to terms with how famous she is or the opportunities that she's given and I think by the end of the movie she's really getting there. But it also is true that while most famous people wouldn't trade it, there are things about it that are really difficult at times without sounding whiny. Yeah, there are things that are more challenging than other things and things that test the patience more than other things. But all workable, all achievable. All, you know, I had someone say to me the other night at the premiere, I'm dressed to the teeth, I'm there with my man, I, my hair looks fabulous. And she said, 
could you tell us about the downside of fame? I said, baby, look at me. You see a downside? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? And it really is all about the way you choose to view it. You're doing another movie with Richard Gere. I'm sure that every person in America has asked you this as well, but it's called Runaway Bride. Mm -hmm. It is not Pretty Woman 2, but it really is just teaming up the two of you again, and Gary Marshall mm -hmm. as well. Are you happy with it? Well, I haven't seen it, um, but we sure had a lot of fun making it. Was it like the old days, or? Well, no, because the difference between being 20 and being 30 is vast. <laughs> I'm like a different person now. And so it was really interesting on a Freudian level, where I've become very kind of the pop psychologist, you know. <laughs> so on that level, I was fascinated at every turn. And it was nice because we had um, some of the same cast that we had in Pretty Woman came in and did things for us. Right, Hector the Elizondo. Guy, the guy from the Ginkgo Bell Biloba <laughs> commercials now. I love him. Oh, Hector. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. yeah. He's always talking about Ginkgo Biloba now. He's but also anyway. on Chicago Hope. I know. He, I, I know. <laughs> More important. Nice. We digress. It's <laughs> <laughs> called Naughty Mail. Julia Roberts, it's really fun talking to you. And we'll be back in a moment. Julia and I are going shopping, though. <laughs> This is our biggest problem on the show, backwards walking. Jenna? Yes? It's Jerry. Oh, Jerry, hi. Hi. Remember we said we were going to have coffee today? Oh, God. Am I late? What do you think? Okay, okay I'm on my way right now. Oh. I'm late. I'll be right there. Fantastic. Oh, lucky who's here. Hey. Hi. How are you? How are you? Don't hit your head. Mwah. Nice to see you. Thank you for meeting me for a little... Coffee? You're really overdressed for just coffee. <laughs> well, you know what? You I came straight elegant. from the show. Oh. But also, I knew there'd be pickles involved. Hi. Okay. Um, sure, I'd love a coffee. You too, I'd love a coffee. Okay, okay great. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. you so, have you had a coffee already this morning? I've, I've had um, three coffees. How many have you had? I've had one espresso. Every day starts with espresso. But it didn't always used it to. It didn't always. For years. I used to do jokes about it. I, oh, I thought... Coffee people were so weird. What is this drink you have to drink? Why? I can't talk until I've had my coffee. Why? Because <laughs> I just got up, yeah? <laughs> I feel tired when I get up. Yeah, we all do. So, okay, you didn't drink coffee, and yet you pitched a show. That well, I was drinking it at that point. That's, oh. what, that's where I got the idea for the show. I went, this is a fantastic drink. It gets people so chatty. This is great. Now, there's something that's, that must be open-minded about you, because to, to go from a no-coffee person to a coffee person takes, you know, I feel like most people stick in one lane. Yeah, I think I am pretty open-minded. I have done a lot of very weird, different things. <laughs> I have explored a lot of avenues in my journey to uh, perfect the human system. And have you perfected it? Pretty close. You look perfect. You look great. No, I, I feel like uh, I'm 68, and uh, I feel pretty good. To celebrate the 10th anniversary of Jerry Seinfeld's hit show, Comedians and Cars Getting Coffee, he's releasing the Comedians and Cars Getting Coffee book, which takes readers behind the scenes of some of the most iconic episodes. Let's talk about this show and this book. I heard okay. that the most nervous you were, which kind of makes sense, was when you went to interview President Obama at the White House. Right. Your I'm, producer said you were a little scared. Yeah. Well, I felt like I was kind of representing every comedian that ever lived. Yes. And I was getting to do something that no comedian has ever done, which is do a little funny bit yeah. in the Oval Office. Yes. Which I don't think anyone's ever done. Did Dana Carvey never do that? Not in the real yeah. Oval Office. Yes. I don't think so. But it was a bit, you know, knocking on the window. Yes. And uh, sitting on the chair. And I heard that the Secret Service were the ones that told you to go knock on the window. I mean, you were behind the bushes 
and knocked on the window. No, I knew I was going to knock on the window. I had asked them. Is that They okay? said, could I do, I asked, I don't remember whose idea it yeah. was, but they said, yeah, yeah, you could do that. Were Which you, I couldn't believe they were going to let I me know. do that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And I thought, this is a great opportunity in the history of comedy, you know, yes. to knock on the window of the Oval Office while the president's Thank working. Thank you. And also, there's lots of Secret Service. Yeah. That are hanging out there. Yeah. So it was a kind of a risk to your to to your safety, right? Why? Why would I be scared? Well, what of if them? one Secret Service man didn't know that Jerry Seinfeld was popping up behind the bushes knocking? I, I I trust the Secret Service. This show is you said is kind of like a Valentine. Yes. Like a funny Valentine to yes. comedians. Yes. Why? You know, let me let me tell you what it, what it's like to be a comedian. Okay. It's 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 the greatest okay. life if you can manage it. Yes. So the hard part is the comedian part. Yes. Making people laugh every night is hard. But if you have that, if you can do that, the the rest of your life, you're with comedians. Yes. And this is becomes a gigantic component of your life and is equally as enjoyable. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted people to see this other side. You know, I would say my life is 25% doing comedy. Yes. 75% hanging out with comedians. Hanging out with funny people. Yes. So you're constantly laughing. Yes. But I think, I guess what surprises surprises me about the show is that it is hilarious, which Thank you. people would expect, but it's also kind of human and mm -hmm. lovely and touching. There were moments where you want to kind of tear up, and I guess y'all are people. But that part, <laughs> that part surprised me. Well, we are people, but we're not normal people. We're, we're all, and what I have found is the gene is kind of the same, yeah. but it gets implanted in all these different types of people. But the essential gene, the comedy gene, is the same. And so it became a study of that or kind of an exploration of that. Look at all these different people that are all very different and they all have this little thing yeah this little uh i don't want to call it a defect but uh <laughs> it's a let's call it an aspect an aspect of their yeah. personality yeah do you remember when you knew you had that i didn't that i thought i was funny you, mean? you knew you were funny because you're not just that you thought you well, were funny i thought everyone was funny as a little kid when you're eight everyone is funny no, but not everybody is funny. You know what I mean? You can think back to like the kids that are not funny. Yeah, there were some, but there were a lot of funny kids. Yes, that's true. Kids are funny. Right. right? And then something it's like thir between 13 and 15 yes. is when it gets uh, slips away because the pressure yeah. of, oh, I've got to be a person now. Yeah. And you're embarrassed, maybe. Yeah. Well, you. you Girls can be. You Yeah, right. You know what I mean? Be yes. embarrassed by that by part being of being Well, being too big or something, right. too much personality. Did your friends think you were funny? Yeah. Do they still think you're funny? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they do. You, I so like you're the funny one. I'm the funny one. That's great. But Barbara's pretty funny. You yes, know my Barbara sister, is funny, she's yeah. funny, but right. I do like to make people laugh. I mean, what does it feel like to you to make people laugh? It's, it's the best thing in the world. It's a, it's a couple of seconds of weightlessness. Mm -hmm where everything in your mind, everything you think about and worry about and work on your whole life is just gone for a second. And it's, and it lasts, you know, you feel, you know, if you have like a big laugh, yes, it lasts, you know, for a, you, the rest of the day you go, that was so funny. And it's you know? fun to see it in kids. You know yeah. what I mean? Because I have a child who like, we actually think is going to be the next Amy Schumer. Oh, wow. She's very wild and hilarious and will do anything for a laugh and when she gets an authentic one like to see that glimmer in their eye to wow. see the glimmer you know what i mean there is something to it yeah the trick is to not lose it yeah you know don't don't dismiss it i think people people think well what what use is this you know yeah i wonder like in a world that feels pretty dark 
you know, I think we can all be like, gosh, what, what service are we unless we're doing more? Mm -hmm. But, and I kind of used to be self-deprecating about my job sitting next to Hoda, but I realized that I'm making people feel good. Yeah. And that that is of service in some way, in some small way. It's not a small way. It's not a small way, it's a big way. And do you feel that way too? Do you feel like, you know what, actually <laughs> making people laugh is something that's super important? It is, yeah. I think I don't think of it kind of socially. I think of it in in the moment. Yeah. It's really important to me to get this laugh right now, because. Yeah. I don't know. You, you become um, you kind of become a machine in comedy. You just like all day, every day. You're thinking about how do I get that joke to work. Yeah. And. I don't. I, I have a, a friend that always talks to me about this. He always says it's not. It is a bigger thing. You are providing a relief. Right. I always say the silly stuff we do. This, you know, it's it's meaningless. You know, he says no, it's extremely meaningful. So, it's a nice thought. Mm -hmm. You get to sit with these hilarious people yes. and laugh, which I think making people laugh feels great, but also there's nothing better than laughing. So let's talk Steve Martin. <laughs> okay. I mean, first of all, the car, uh, you had some car issues. We've had a lot of car <laughs> issues over the history of doing the show. Yeah, because we want, I always, I love old cars. Yes. Especially interesting ones. And people think that they're maintaining them and they're not. <laughs> And we go, is this a good car? And they go, oh, yeah, I keep it perfect. And they don't. So with Steve, what happened there? You said there was some sort it, of... It broke down at some point. What was it? I believe it yeah, was it a Yeah, it broke Fiat... down on the side of the road. Yeah. Fiat... I believe it was a Fiat 8V, if I recall, which was a really artistic car that I thought he would like because he's such an art guy. Yes. Oh, Jerry, I know you're trying to be funny. Whoa. Now, what is she thinking, that lady? She's thinking, you know... I'm sure that's not Steve Martin and Jerry Seinfeld, but the resemblance is unbelievable. And were y'all able to fix it? Or you need somebody else no, for that? No, I remember we had to get in like a rent-a-car. <laughs> yeah. You and Steve and, and yeah. an old Buick. Yeah. And a Toyota Camry. Yeah, and a Camry it was really makes you sad. <laughs> it wasn't exactly what you were hoping. No. Now, do you prepare, how do you prepare for these? Because it's I kind don't. of, you don't prepare at all. No. See, I'm more interested, like, uh, that first question I ask you is, you've had three coffees today. I like the tiny little behaviors of human life. Yes. What was the first one? Is it a routine? How do you make it? You know, I'm interested in coffee. I'm interested in, in people's beds and their shoes and their combs, you know. I, I like the, uh, small, the small things are the big things to me. Which makes total sense, right? Do yeah. You, now, do you make your bed? No, I do not. Does Jessica make your bed? Yes, she does. Of course she does. <laughs> of course she does. Why? Because I like Jessica. <laughs> she gets things done. Oh, she sure does. Right? Yeah. But aren't you lucky you married somebody like that and had children with somebody that gets everything done? Lucky is not the word. Saved is the word. Mm. I'm a rescue pet. <laughs> <laughs>
So you don't prepare at all. You don't Google. Like, what if you don't know the person? You know everybody? I Google. I read the first three sentences. I just want to know where they grew up. Are they yeah. married? They have kids. Okay. That's all. I don't need to know anything else about a person to have a So Wikipedia is really your sort of... Yeah. Yeah. I. The things I'm interested in are not, in, you know, in the bio. Which makes the, the show so good. Oh, thanks. And the coffee table book. Did you ever think you'd have a coffee table book? No. I didn't. Are you proud of it? I didn't. <laughs> well, they don't give you a book unless the show works. Yes. So, yes, I am proud of it. And the show worked, and people are asking, will there be more? They are. I don't know. I actually just started thinking about it just recently, but I did a movie, and I'm kind of... Uh, you did a movie? I made a movie, yeah, during the... Uh, the virus, we wrote a movie and then we made it, and now we're finishing it and it's gonna come out pretty soon. Wow, what does that feel like? Amazing. Yeah. That's something I never thought I would do. But because of the virus, I wasn't doing anything and I had time to write it. Because otherwise I, don't, I can't stop doing stand-up, I can't stop. It's too, too much fun. Yeah, it's just like, it's like my life <laughs> uh, routine. I have to, you know, it's yeah. so much fun. So now the fact that there's going to be this film. Yeah. Can you tell me anything about it? Sure. Have you already talked about it and I just didn't do no, enough I research? No, I haven't. I haven't. What, what is it? Um, it's a, it takes place in 1964. Wow. So it's a period piece. Yes. It takes place in Battle Creek, Michigan. And it's um, about how they invented the Pop-Tart. Wow. <laughs> That's genius. Yeah. Do you like a pop tart? I love the pop tart. Which, which is your favorite flavor? Brown sugar. Cinnamon. Me too. Of course. Me too. But a lot of people like strawberry, with the frosty. That's them. No, but brown sugar cinnamon. See, that was the probably the first. Is that the first thing you made when you were a kid that was hot? Yes. Yeah. Or maybe an Eggo waffle, but hot. Right. Yeah. That's the most luxurious thing, like because an Eggo waffle, is just like toast, glorified yeah, toast. Yeah. Right. A but pop tart a pop is compl tart, complicated. It has all that. Sometimes some of them have yeah. sprinkles. Mm -hmm. So is this a is this a real story or you? No. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so it wasn't... there are certain real elements in it. Okay. The truth of the story is, Post and Kellogg's both had the idea at the same time. Wow. And then they competed to who could come out with it first. Yes. And then we just completely made Came up. Came up. It's totally insane. Comedy. It's like 15 stand-up comics are in this. Are you, are you starring in it? Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I directed it. That is incredible. I know. It's really exciting. Most people just learned how to like bake bread during the pandemic, and you yeah. wrote and directed and are going to star yeah. in a film. Yeah. Can we get coffee and talk about it when it comes out? Sure. And maybe bring Jessica. But I do want to ask you. you your wife posted something right. on Instagram. Right. I follow her. Right. I adore her. <laughs> Um, I thought it was a simple way to say something that needs to be said. In October, Jerry's wife of 23 years, Jessica, posted on Instagram in support of the Jewish faith after a string of highly publicized anti-Semitic events. The post read, I support my Jewish friends and the Jewish people. And the caption read, if you don't know what to say, you can just say this in your feed. When we look at the rise of anti-Semitism mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. this country and really around the world, mm -hmm. um, what, like, how, what, do you, how, what do you think of it? She found a simple, and I thought, non-aggressive yeah. way to say something that, as we said, unfortunately needs to be said, but does need to be said. And uh, I thought that was very uh, special and, and fantastic thing she did. Mm -hmm. Hard to do. It is hard right? to do. Well, simplicity. Most things in that venue, it's going to trigger someone. It's going to inflame. We're so quick for to inflame, right? Mm -hmm. Both sides of any debate. Yes. Women, uh, gender, ev everything. Yeah. Right? This is the culture we live in. Flash paper. Yeah. Instant, violent yes. verbiage. Yes. Right? And she found a way to sort of quiet it. Right. And hopefully also raise awareness. Yeah. That was a great thing.
Okay, I want to go over a list of some of these comedians that were on. Okay. And just if you have something to say. Okay. Say it. Um, Eddie Murphy. I feel like Eddie Murphy was like, well, was maybe the best episode there ever was. That was probably next to the Obama one, which was unique for those circumstances, yes. obvious. But uh, reconnecting with Eddie, who he and I started together the same month, the same club together. And then, of course, he quickly went one way, and then I went another way. And, and then years, after all those years, to get back together was so thrilling. And he was so, again, you, I talk about this thing, yeah. you know? Yes. And there it is, and he's still got it, you know? And he's still talking about it. And he talks about, in the show, being on Long Island and going to these clubs with these guys in a car, and then after the club, you go to a place like this. Oh my gosh. This is the life. This is the life. Hanging out with the company. You do the show, you do great, you do horrible, <laughs> but you wind up here. Having There's coffee and a pastrami sandwich. Yes, and, and writing jokes on napkins and making fun of each other. <laughs> You know. <laughs> Did you ha do you have napkins where you have jokes? I mean, do you remember you, yourself, doing that, coming to a, a No, place? I got a notebook. Yeah. I oh, said, I, a notebook. I need a notebook for this work. profession. I need yeah. a notebook for this type of work. <laughs> yeah. But you probably have, I'm sure you have written a joke or two down on a napkin. Yes, I have. To be reunited with him must have been very cool. It was, it was uh, beautiful. It was beautiful. And you could feel that. Oh, that's great. You could. So... You've seen a few of these. Yes, I've seen a few of yours. Oh, that's nice. People love the show. Wow. Did you not know that? I, for most of the time I was doing it, I didn't think it was working. You didn't think it while you were doing it? Yeah. But I loved it, and I wanted to make it. Yeah. I just wanted to make this. Well, I, I want to show people this side of comedy life, because people just got so interested in comedy yes. the past 20 yes. years, you know? Yes, yes. So that's why I did it. I think also it's like, and why people are asking now is that that kind of connection, you know, that kind of being with somebody funny and making each other laugh, that kind of conversation, especially since y'all were together mm -hmm. in this small area, like mm -hmm. was something we, we missed during the pandemic, you know? Well, you tell me, don't you feel, I mean, you do more interviews than anyone. This kind of thing. Yeah. Is different, right? Yes. Because you're not, because just like you said, there is no preparation. Right. You're just sitting down for a wonderful conversation over right. coffee. Right. But also, I think, with the goal of laughing and having others laugh too. Mm hmm. Like, there's a lightness to that, right? Very much so. And I'm not really much of a podcast person because I like edited content. Yeah. I like, I love that I could take three hours and give you a great 12. Yes, yes. Because that, that's Who what comedy it? is. Yes. When you go see a comedian, he's basically going, I have lots of crazy thoughts, some of them are funny, and I've cut it down to just that. Yes. That's what you're seeing. Because when you work on a show, you write something, how long does it take like, to get down to what you're actually going to perform? Well, I don't know, because I do it all the time. Yeah. But everything is trimmed down to the... and. and Essential aspect of comedy is it has to be trimmed down to the absolute minimum. It's like a poem. Yes. It has to be like and a poem. And good books, really good books are yeah. edited well. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the most important part, of, it, part yes. of all of it. Yeah, but books are long. I love books. That's nice. You don't? I do, I love books. But I don't read a lot. I'm trying to think if I have anything good if for I you. If I can get rid of the phone. Yeah, yeah, I put the phone I, away. Put I the phone away. Read. What are you doing on your phone? Nothing good. Scrolling? Well, how else can you get to the next thing? But we have to scroll. But what are you? Are you looking at articles? Or are you looking at social media? What What are you doing? Are you I on look Instagram? At cars. I'm, I, I look on Instagram, and I love YouTube. No, you don't. I love YouTube. What do you like on YouTube? Cat videos? Here's what I found the greatest video on YouTube. <laughs> what is it? Yesterday. <laughs> I have spent years on YouTube. Countless hours, and yesterday, I found a video that changed my life so powerfully. A guy made a video about 
You know how when you turn on your windshield wipers, sometimes they go... Yes. He made a video about how to fix that. How do you fix it? And you don't need new wipers. What? How do you... And you don't need a new wiper arm. It's an adjustment with two wrenches, and he shows you... Would you ever do that? Oh, I can't wait to do it. Are you going to do it? Yeah. So that's what I love. You love it. Because I hate when wipers do that. I hate that sound. I know what you and mean. And somebody solved it, and they made a video and that, and and showed everyone. How, how did to... you come to that YouTube video? I don't know. They, I they like targeted the... you. Yeah. You are. I YouTube. like the algorithm. I don't watch anything unless the algorithm suggests it. Well, you do, and they just targeted you with the yeah. perfect video, which is the windshield wipers. Windshield wipers. wiper adjustment. So you like that kind of like how to fix it? You're not into. No, that. I'm into. I'm into. I'm. Surfing, oh, surfing, baseball, cars, dogs. I like cute dog videos. Yeah, who doesn't? You know. You should follow Round Boys on Instagram. It's really good. It's just round animals. <laughs> Your wife would love it. <laughs> just all about the roundness of animals. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, I love things. Like, I love unboxing videos. Unboxing videos. Here's what it is. I really think. Obsession is a nice way to go through life. Yeah. Being obsessive. Yes. As long as you don't go completely crazy. <laughs> yes. Obsessing. I've obsessed on everything about everything my entire well, life. Well, that's true. That's why you're famous, right? Because the the show is like it's obsessing all... over the little nuance exactly. of life. Right. Yes. So that's entertainment to me. Yeah. Well, it's entertainment to us too. Yeah. Turns out. Turns out it's entertainment <laughs> to all of us as well. Yeah, but we all live these lives of uh, micro obsession, yes. right? Not micro aggression, micro obsession. Okay, I've learned so much. And those things, I think, are if you miss out on the fun of that. Yes. I just think it's fun. It's a fun. I I like to find entertainment in life. Yes. I don't want to just drag myself through this. I want to enjoy it. Yes. No, it's so true. If you can't find the fun and the nuance and the tediousness of life, then you're not living. What was the point of yeah, all of that? It's true. Right? It's true. Find the fun in it. And I personally believe the fun is in the ordinary. Mm -hmm. sure not is. in the special. Mm -hmm. The ordinary. I love right? this so much. I know. Me too. I, I could it. sit here forever. Me too. Cheers. Well, cheers. But can we do it when your movie comes out? Yes. Isn't it better? It's Well, the Pop-Tarts, I can't wait. You get stuff done, okay? You get stuff done. Has that been kind of the secret sauce? Because you're not here by accident, obviously. You're a talented human being. You've got all the things going for you. But how much did that play into your success? I am goal-oriented. I am solution-oriented. I don't get stuck in a problem. I like to, you know, figure it out. And I feel like when you can figure it out, then you move a lot faster than people who kind of get stuck. And I used to, when I was younger, I would definitely get stuck. But I think um, being in the industry kind of teaches you that, you know, survival of the fittest and the only way you kind of survive is by actually doing the work and getting stuff done. But it means you gotta be confident in your voice. When did that come to you? I think I didn't know any different when I st started working first because I was 17 or 18, I was a teenager and to me, it didn't matter when I got paid. I was 
just happy to get the job. I was really happy to be in the mix. I was really happy to get, you know, I was learning the craft. I'd never been to school, acting school or anything. So, you know, my, my observations were just, you know, what is everyone else doing around me? How can I learn? And I think that's something I still have. I'm a student of life. I don't expect that I know everything. So when I ask for something, it never comes from a place of, even now, it doesn't come from a place of, I expect this done. It comes from a place of, here's why it needs to be done. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, I come with reason um, because I don't like being told no to. So I, I, I make the situation such that it's hard to say no, where I'll be like, this is why it's necessary. Here's why we should make the change. Um, I'm never, con like, I never, I'm not someone who likes conflict. I love collaboration. So I always make it, um, so, and, and that started very young. I, I feel like when you give people, instead of, I learn and I tell young girls, this specifically girls, um, but mostly for young people, is confidence is, is not it's it's self-taught well talk about i mean self-confidence from being a kid i mean you came to this country i think you were 13. i mean most 13s there's no more awkward or insecure or scared time in your life than that that little window right there yet somehow you had the moxie to come here you had the moxie to say i want to try this i mean that's that's big confidence for a kid that age it was, I don't know if I had the confidence. I think I just didn't know any better. I was just really excited about going to America because to me, American high schools were like, you know, Beverly Hills 90210 or like Saved by the Bell. We had to wear uniforms because the socioeconomic background of most children is very different. So to create uniformity in school, it's mandatory to have uniforms. Whereas in America, you could wear whatever you want. Plus, I was also in a girl's school till I was in the 12th grade. So the added benefit of, you know, being around boys was very enticing at that point. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It, I'm, so wait, were you, um, I was always embarrassed about boys and dating at that age. I always wondered, would anyone even look my way? What did you feel like when you were that age? I liked looking. I didn't know I could do anything about it, <laughs> but I kind of like, I was, I went to boarding school when I was in second grade, third grade. My mom sent me to boarding school because my parents were, they had just, um, you know, exited the army and they were setting up their own private practice. And when I went, I went there as a baby. But when I came back to my parents' home and went back to my school, I was like, I'm a woman. You haven't, you haven't lived, you still live with your parents. I went to boarding school. I lived by myself. I had this like, with my classmates, I had this crazy sense of confidence when I would tell them what happens when you don't have adults supervising you. And they used to look up at me as if I had had this magical experience at Narnia, which was inaccurate. I just kind of made it up. And I realized, I think, you know, looking back, I think a lot of confidence comes from, I don't like to say fake it till you make it because I don't believe in faking anything. I think talking to yourself and having a dialogue with yourself, which hypes you to be what you need to be, is a very healthy thing. And I think in different phases of my life, I kind of taught myself or learned how to be my own hype girl. And it kind of helped me navigate many really crazy situations, like especially coming to America at 13. And Did you have uh, friends? Did you feel a part of something or...? Eventually I made friends, but in the beginning, like this is the first, like say three or four weeks when I didn't know anyone. And I used to just, the vending machine was easy. I preferred my own environment because I just didn't understand how to navigate hallways, how to find homeroom, how to go to a cafeteria, how do you grab a tray? All that was new for me. So I think I observed for the first three or four weeks and then I got the confidence because I'd seen and what kids do I got the confidence to walk into the ca cafeteria and I was like all right now I know what to do I'm not going to look like an idiot did you ever feel I mean I felt this way when I was in school for much of the my life my parents came here from Egypt and they wanted us to be red white How and old blues. Were you? Um, I was born in the states but they came here as newlyweds and my brother sister and I were all born here but somehow you always are kind of different. Like I remembered playing spin the bottle when I was probably in sixth grade and I was praying it would land on Todd and it did. And when he looked at me when it landed, he said, I think that's going too far. 
and I'll never forget it. It was like a knife in my heart because I had dreamt of that moment. But it kind of reminded me that sometimes you aren't quite in with the other kids and that kind of underscored it for me. I didn't know what your experiences were like in school. Did you feel like you fit or not? No, I don't think I, I didn't think I ever fit. And I don't know if it had to do with me being Indian or it had to do with me being non-American. I think that's kind of what it was. I was an immigrant kid. Um, I spoke differently. I tried to fit in a lot. I changed a lot of my identity when I was in ninth grade to kind of fit in. I I was in Queens for a short, a short period, like a couple of semesters because my aunt who I was living with was moving around. And living in New York just in ninth grade made me realize that the world is not just one type of people. There are so many different kinds of people. And then after that, when I moved around, I kind of had an arsenal of that, you know, if you're made to feel isolated, it's not kind of true because Queens was like this incredible melting pot of like people from Ethiopia to people from like Afghanistan to like, you just act in my own block. I met like people from everywhere in the world. It was incredible. But I never felt like I fit, in, fit into school um, because I came from a conservative family. You know, we, my family wasn't about, you can go out at nine, you can date boys, like that stuff didn't exist. So, and that was very different. And I had to kind of explain it, why I can't talk to boys. So that would be really embarrassing, even though I was someone who liked the attention, even though I was someone who liked to wear makeup and I would come back home um, dressed in whatever I went to school in. But when I went to school, I would change it to like the shortest shorts of yeah. the crop tops and, you know, do all of that stuff. But trying to fit in is such a big part of being a teenager that I think I did the same thing. But I, I remember my crush was Seth and he had green hair and this was me and, and he never knew I existed. I may have mustered up the courage to say hi once. And that was the only time he looked at me and he just smiled and walked away. But I was, he was never in my league. And I, I absolutely understand what you felt. But the fact that he smiled at me or even looked at me when I said hi, or I think I passed him a pencil or something, he was in front of me. But he looked at me and my day was made. There's so many things that shaped you and formed who you are. As you're talking, you're someone who uses your hands, and I love that. And of course, you've got a tattoo I see that says, Daddy's little girl. And I was thinking about you and that moment and what an impact your father has had on you in your lifetime. And um, I often, I, we have a lot in common. My dad passed away, too. I was much, I was in college when it happened to me, but I remembered yes, thinking like, Thank you. I remembered wondering one day, and I asked myself this question too, what did you lose that day? So what, what did you lose the day your father passed? I think I lost my greatest cheerleader. I felt like that for the longest time. And don't get me wrong, my mom was cheering me all the way. And, you know, she handles my whole life when I'm out to work. Like she's with the baby right now while I'm talking to you, you know, and 
makes my life completely amazing and has been my mentor from when I was a kid. But my dad was my cheerleader. He was he used to get so excited if I ever won an award, if I signed a new movie. He was my hype guy. He would love just standing and watching me be, you know, on set, just being me. He just loved that. He he would just want to be around to watch me do what I do. And that was um, a very isolating feeling when he left. I kind of was very disoriented. I felt like, you know, I, I, I don't know how to cheer myself on. I didn't know how to get excited. I went into a really dark place because I was very, very close to my father. He was, and he, cancer is a really bad disease. It, it, to see the deterioration of a human being. And my father was a defense army man. You know, he used to wear his you know, uniform and ride in his bike and handsome, tall and life of a party. And then to see what that disease did to him in his last few days kind of really broke me as well. Um, but I felt like I had lost my cheerleader. I think that's what I think I lost that day. Um, a lot of us go through life and we always compare someone who we will fall in love with, with our fathers. It's just, it's, I think it's a natural way that we go through life. You need someone who measures up somehow. Well, look at you. You found this wonderful, wonderful man. What was it about him and what is it about your, your love story that you think makes this so magical and makes it work? He's my cheerleader. He's the most secure man. I've ever been with. He gets extremely excited at my wins. He takes off my extensions at the end of the night. He um, fixes my dress when I walk off stage and makes sure it looks right when I'm on the carpet. He brings me my coffee first thing in the morning. Um, he's all the things that, you know, a girl dreams of and you kind of never end up having it when, you know, you have all of those aspirations and you're let down. But my husband is the kindest, most generous, gentle, thoughtful man, and also extremely intelligent and patient. He's just so even-tempered, can handle any kind of thing thrown at him, and also has the ability to be vulnerable with me, honest and vulnerable about his fears, um, about, I, I think just having the honesty to be able to say anything to your person and know that that's nothing can phase them and that they're, they're still with you and will still grab your hand when you walk out the door, no matter what happens to you is a very safe feeling. And I feel safe with my husband. It's a, it's, I, I wish that for everyone. Mm. I feel like sobbing right now, although I'm not going to because it would be weird. But it's, but by the way, that's so beautiful. And what I like is whether love takes time or whether love happens in an instant, when you know, you know. And you guys were like whirlwind city. And here you sit with a beautiful baby and a beautiful relationship. Uh, you know, I guess yeah. just the way it was Our intended. Our relationship has only evolved. You're right, because we didn't know each other very well. We didn't know each other's lives and temperaments but we knew that there was something that just drew us together we wherever we went we just kind of we were just drawn to each other we did i knew him for almost two years before we started dating and i mean i've said this before but honestly i didn't give it much of a chance because you know i was like he's 25 years old he's a rock star like i want to get married i want to settle down i want to have a baby i was 35 at the time and i was like I've been there and done the fun thing. Like now I'm in a place where I wanted stability. And I just, I didn't give Nick enough credit till I went out with him on our first date. And then we spent like the whole evening together. And I realized my husband is just like an old soul. He's, he's stability in human form. <laughs>
baby malty, which is like, I don't know how you can improve upon what is it. It looks like a beautiful, perfect life, but that's how you do it right there. That little baby, first of all, that baby tested you. When that baby came into the world, it was scary, and the baby needed love, care, and all of your prayers and everything. What were those initial days like when Malty was born? This is another really amazing example of the strength that my husband has. I kind of like shut down. I, when we heard, I just, I didn't know how to react. And I remember he just held me by my shoulders and he said, and I said, just tell me what to do because I don't know what to do. And he's like, just get into the car with me. Just change, get into the car with me. And we drove to the NICU. I mean, we drove to the hospital. She was born. And from the moment she took her first breath to now, she's never been without one of us, ever. We used to divide our days where, so that because we were both working, um, if I would take the morning shift and stay in the ICU with her, for like six or seven hours, we used to do skin to skin because of the nurses, I mean, in a NICU, they did God's work um, and they really encouraged us to be very hands on with her, even though she was so tiny. She was in the hospital for about 110 days. Uh, and and then Nick would come in the evening and I would go home and then he would spend like five, six hours with her. Um, I don't think it was our test. I think it was her test. I realized very, very early that I did not have the luxury to be scared or to be weak because she was scared and she was weak. And I had to be her strength as her mom. I needed to make her feel at every given moment that she's not alone, that she has someone who can handle her, that we've got her. And that's all we did. And we prayed and we were there with her every single moment. And today she's the greatest gift of our lives. And <laughs> just like my whole life, our whole lives revolve around her. Oh my gosh. I love the name Malty. That just come out. It's my mom's room. middle name. That's your mom's middle name. Oh, oh my God. It's my mom's middle name is Malty and his mom's middle name is Marie. So she's called Malty Marie. Malty Marie. How beautiful. And she's with you right now. Yeah, she's asleep with my mom, actually. <laughs> of course. I love the idea that she's she's never been without you. When you finally were able to bring Malti home, out of the NICU, into your house, and you were finally a family in a, you know, in your, in your home, in a normal setting, what was that like for you? Oh, it was terrifying, because I was a... Being a NICU parent, you really get used to the monitor. And NICU parents watching this will understand that. Like, you know your child is alive because you can see their heartbeat. I couldn't sleep for days because now suddenly she was home without a monitor. I used to, like, put my ear on her chest. I would wake up every couple of, you know, minutes to just see if she's okay. For weeks, this went on um, till I found a camera that could do it. <laughs> And then I was like, hi, I can sleep better because I can see her heartbeat. <laughs> wow, I love it. You know what? It's so crazy when I think about your life because it has all the facets. Um, you are a beautiful mom and a loving wife. And then in the show Citadel, you're like kicking ass. Like every woman is like, yes, like I want to be, I want to have that kind of moxie. I mean, is there a part of you who has that kind of stuff inside you like your character does in citadel did you just throw a knife at me i think so i, I mean i like i'm i'm from the land of india I'm from the land of gandhi i believe in non-violence but i could take i could take someone on i'm i'm pretty sure of that <laughs> i mean you're strong you. girl that you're you're strong too i mean how do you have like seriously the time to do all of the different things how how do you parse that out I used to burn the candle on both ends. I won't lie. When I first started in my 20s, I'd never even taken a vacation for 10 years because, you know, I was greedy. I was like, I want to do everything. I don't want someone else to have this part. If I, I, I would make schedule my days in a way where I could do four movies a year because I wanted to do everything. I was just hungry. And then slowly I realized that that just chipped away at my soul. 
I started, I didn't know who I was. I didn't have preferences, likes, dislikes. Everything was just my work. And that's fine because I'm extremely blessed to have an incredible career and uh, for almost 23 years now. And, uh, you know, our jobs are not the most stable. Like, I don't know where, you know, as an actor, you don't know where your next paycheck is coming from. You just have to get to the next job. So I've, I've managed all right for almost two decades. But in the beginning, it was crazy. After that, in my 30s, I think I realized that the thing that they say about work-life balance actually is a real thing. And now I've reached a point where I work till it's bath time at about seven o'clock. And then after that, I'm not available. Um, that's my time with my family. We do bath time, story time, bedtime. And then it's Nick and our, my time, whether we go out, whether we have friends over, whether we just sit together and watch a movie. Like having family time is... It just makes me want to do and conquer the world when I wake up and do a million things and I can do them really well because I know that I come back home to my family. And that just, that's such a priority to me now. your spirit I love reading I love traveling when I travel I love observing I love culture um you know they say when in Rome I really am a believer of that wherever in the world I go I eat local food in every country I go to um and I'm kind of training my daughter how to do that too she's extremely um her palate is very global um from Korean barbecue to pasta to Indian food. She's great. Uh, but my spirit gets filled with people, travel, culture, laughs, jokes, community, good times, a table full of food and family and friends. It's truly what fulfills my soul. But also being able to go to work and, you know, when people watch my work for them to say, wow, I can't believe you did that. Even after all of these years, I, I get, I work it, it's the most satisfying thing to me when my work is appreciated by the people that I work with and the audiences that watch my work. Like, that really fulfills my spirit because I put a lot of myself in my job. You seem so comfortable in your own skin. Like, you know exactly who you are, you know exactly what you, what you want and why you want it. Um, being comfortable in our bodies is some, sometimes a different thing. It takes years sometimes. Some people go to their grave and they're never comfortable. They just want to be in a muumuu -moo and hide. Um, when was when was your most difficult challenges with your body and what you how you perceived it and how do you feel now in your own skin? I mean, I think the thirties were kind of tumultuous for me when it came to my body. Um, you know, because as a, as you grow, as you know, your body's changing. I was going from this twenties teen like body, which is you know, metabolism is at its highest, and then you reach your mid thirties and you're like, oh. I can't skip a meal and it'll just look great. Like you can't do that. You can't just work out for four days and come back to your, um, you know, pre-vacation body. <laughs> but um, I think that 
you know, the standards of beauty in the industry are, especially for women, extremely skewed. And I've spoken about this tremendously. Um, but I would, I think I, my dad passed away. I had moved countries. I'd come to America. I was filming Quantico at that time. I didn't have many friends. I was in New York. I felt a lack of community. I would emotionally eat. Um, I would just emotionally drink. I would, I wasn't taking care of myself in the best possible way. And it had nothing to do with how people perceived me, but I perceived myself as not the best version of myself. And it was a really tough time for me to be able to like say, all right, I'm going to, you know, do what's good for my body because emotionally I wasn't there. Um, and, and I think that's okay. I've, I, I've, I've thought about that phase in my life a lot and my body needed to mourn, my heart needed to mourn and yeah, you know, I needed pizzas to do it. So I allowed myself to do that pizza and a bottle of wine and a movie, you know, my heart needed it. I did it for a while. And then I reached a point where I knew that, you know, bottom had been hit and now the only way was up and I started taking one step another step, you know, maybe going to the gym two times or maybe even walking for breakfast or starting to find my health again, my mental and physical health, trying to reach out to friends. Friends had stopped inviting me to things because I would never go. I just wanted to go home and just hide. And then slowly I would say yes, or I would reach out to someone. I started choosing myself instead of the darkness that is productive and that kind of reaches out for you sometimes and that can happen to anyone anytime as soon as you choose what's good for you and w stop waiting for somebody else to be you know that hand to pull you out of it it's a very powerful thing you're unbelievable i swear that was so awesome we're crying over here okay we're crying over here we have people in our room crying Priyanka, thank you so much. Thanks for the time. Thanks for staying up late. Thanks for being amazing. Thank, just thank you. You know what? I would love for you to join me. Aww. You should. <laughs> Four months ago to the day, Janet Jackson invited this girl from Wichita, Kansas to be her backup dancer on tour. Well, you didn't have to ask me twice. I am hours away from hitting that stage and living my best.